Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and call this meeting to order. Welcome. It's great to see everybody here in person. It's great to have our colleagues. We have a number of colleagues online. It's great to have them online with us today. Uh, this is a hybrid meeting, so some of our members have call, have are on the Zoom panel today, and that's excellent. For the record, my name is James Erskine, Everglades Coordinator with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and your working group chair. I'll take a moment and I'll introduce our chairs here at the table. We'll let the chairs introduce themselves and then we'll take care of some of the front matter. Hmm. Hey, I'm Lawrence Glenn. I'm the, um, wow, i am been on vacation for two weeks, so I have lost for words, lost for everything. Uh, I'm the chair of the science coordination group. Uh, I'm really looking forward to a fresh new year. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff ahead of us, a lot of interesting things to work through, and I just appreciate your time and being here. Um, I think collectively we can get to the ends that we need to get to, so thank you. Angie? Hmm. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, Angie Dunn, um, Vice Chair of the Science Coordination Group, Army Corps of Engineers. And Nick? I'm Nick Allman, Vice Chair of the Working Group with USGS. I coordinate the Greater Everglades Priority Ecosystem Sciences Program. And looking forward to this meeting. A couple things, just one announcement. We, you know, we talk about some of the upcoming conferences from now and then. We have the National Conference on Ecosystem Restoration coming up in April in Albuquerque. We have a really exciting lineup, both for plenary speakers. We've, we've invited uh, Secretary Holland to be the closing keynote. Of course, we won't know until pretty soon before the conference whether she can do that. But we do otherwise have some really good uh, talks, including a focus on the desert southwest, which I think will be really interesting. And last thing I wanted to say is, and I know uh, Lawrence and Angie will say a lot more about this, but I just wanted to give a look ahead to our last agenda item, which is a discussion of possible science topics for future discussion. And that's something I'm really keen on, hoping that we can get uh, some more time in the, in the meetings. And we talked about possibly having, you know, day and a half or separate meetings sometimes just to give more time to devote to science. And we would like everyone's input on what some of those uh, compelling topics might be that would benefit from such a discussion. So looking forward to that. Thank you, James. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, it's great to put that out in the front right now so people have a little bit of time during the day for it to roll around and collect ideas on it. Um, so we have some materials we need to just go over. We'd just like to let everyone know that we are being recorded. And when that on-air sign is up there, you are on air. When you're using your microphones, you need to press and hold the button here. Um, we will be going, we will have a public engagement opportunity, public comment towards the end of the meeting. 
And I'd like to engage, encourage everyone who wants to speak in the public comment period to submit a public comment card if you're here in the room. Um, online members that are, want to provide public comment, your microphones and services for the Zoom platform will be activated at that public comment time. The members that are participating on Zoom have active mics and live cameras. And that's just a reminder for our members at home, use your mic and camera as, as you would for any meeting for the members of the SCG and the working group. Uh, but please raise your hand at the end of the presentation so we can call on you for, for an acknowledgement and uh, bring your remarks to the table. I would like to take a moment and see, I would like to recognize we have a new member at the table here, an alternate. Paul, Paul, would you like to take a moment and introduce yourself? Yeah. Paul Lynn, Palm Beach County. Uh, I have uh, been working for the district for about 22 years and went to FPL for three years as their dam safety officer, and now I'm with Palm Beach County as the water resources manager. So happy to be here. Welcome, Paul. Sandy, Sandy, you have some um, information you'd like to share with the group as well? Hi, James. Uh, uh, this is Alan. I will be providing those for those on the participating on the Zoom platform today. Members of the public who have not provided their name and affiliation will be removed by the administrator for security purposes. Please note that all attendees are automatically muted and are in listen only mode. Please refrain from raising your hand until the public comment period has been announced. Raised hands before the public comment period will be lowered by the administrator. Once the public comment period begins, please use the raise your hand feature located at the bottom of your Zoom window and we will call on you and unmute your microphone one at a time. When you have been called on to speak, please ensure that all other devices are muted to avoid any background noises and interruptions. If any attendee experiences any Zoom technical issues during the meeting, you can access the live webcast on evergladesrestoration.gov. Back to you, James, thank you. Thank you. Now that we've got the particulars out of the way, let's go ahead and we'll start right around the room. Um, we'll start with our, Lawrence, why don't you go ahead and start with our SCG members? Sure, uh, I'd like to introduce, um, if he's online today, who's going to be here in person, we have a new member representing the Miccosukee tribe and it's Marcel Bozas. If you're online, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, good morning, can you hear me? Sure can. All right, good morning. Yeah, I apologize. I couldn't make it in today. Uh, I got caught up in the office. Um, I've been with the tribe for six years now. And since uh, the departure of uh, Craig Vanderheiden, uh, I'll be taking over for his position as the acting director here at Mississippi Tribe Fish and Wildlife, as well as uh, working with you all on this, uh, the science coordination group. Really looking forward to our discussion today. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Marcel, and we're happy to have you. Um, Gil McRae. Good morning, everybody. Gil McRae. I'm the, with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, member of the Science Coordination Group. Looking forward to today, today's discussion on the Coral Reef Coordination Team, which I'm on, as, as well as uh, Eric, and the uh, science discussion. So good to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. I'll have Chris Keppel. Hi, Chris Kelbel from NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory. Um, just looking for the, forward to the meeting. I wanted to uh, highlight that we do have a new project starting that's looking at moldy stressors in South Florida. So it's looking at the impacts of ocean acidification, sea surface temperature, eutrophication um, <clears throat> on the various marine habitats around South Florida. And a part of the restoration, part of the project is to look at potential restoration scenarios. So it's looking at Everglades restoration as well as seagrass restoration as potential mitigations for these stressors. So uh, we have several people in this group that are serving on that uh, management review committee that we have our kickoff meeting this week. So thank you all. Thanks, Chris. Stephanie, I did not mean to pass you by. <laughs> Stephanie Romanek. Uh, I didn't notice if you did pass me by. So. <laughs> Um, I'm Stephanie Romaniak with the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm really looking forward to the science discussion. I um, only found out about it the other day, but I'm, uh, and the, the chairs can uh, rein me in, but I would like to uh, 
hope that we can think kind of broadly and wildly, and uh, if the chairs agree with that, and then we can uh, filter later, but it'd be really nice to get some exciting ideas on the table. Thanks. Thank you. Holly Milbrandt. I'm going off colors. Chad, are you are you working group or your science coordination group? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Chad Kennedy. I'm with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And it's kind of the part of the whip around. The department's doing a lot of things, especially for water quality. And the legislature has been very good to us. Last year, uh, they provided $20 million to work on nutrients in Lake Okeechobee. So we actually have just gotten responses back recently about some projects to actually physically remove some nutrient from Lake Okeechobee. So I'm excited about that and it's in development. We're still working it through, but um, $20 million is not enough to clean up the lake tomorrow, but it is definitely good seed money to kind of get started. And that's just one of the many projects we're working on, including harmful algal bloom um, response for acute blooms and things like that. So I just thought I'd mention that, that the state is, you know, doing some good work out there and some uh, sediment nutrient flux studies were just recently uh, funded. So the department is pretty active in trying to get a handle on nutrient um, fluxes in the lake and see what we can do to reduce that water and the nutrient moving out of the lake. Thank you, Chad. That is great news. Eric Stabenow. So Eric Stabenow, National Park Service, South Florida Natural Resources Center. Hearing a little bit of a static in the speaker over here. Um, Good morning. Really happy to be here with the group today. I love the fact that we do have this open agenda item associated with science later in the conversation, but this week we had, or just last week, we had opportunity with a, a CISRB committee coming out to review progress and regulates restoration. And in the process there, I have to say, I was really excited about the amount of work we were doing and we're having so much work going on, particularly on the boundary at Everglades National Park and up there near Big Cypress, that the discussion, big part of the day's discussion was just how to coordinate having that many trucks on the same road at the same time in the same spaces and, uh, and kind of what a blessing it is to be at that point in this process and being engaged here. So I'm really happy to, to see that work going on and looking at the fact that we're making these connections from these inland systems all the way out to our coral reefs right now is just, uh, again, a really exciting time to be working here. So let's see what happens today. Thank you. Garrett, uh, before we go online, I'd like to come over to my co-chair, Angie Dunn. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, make a shameless plug for the core and the water management district, our great partners in Everglades restoration. Uh, we do have WERP public meetings. Uh, we have one tomorrow night in Monoc Immokalee at 5 p.m., as well as a virtual meeting uh, to go over the draft PIR EIS on January 18th at 5 p.m. Uh, it's also our scoping period right now for the A2 STA operational plan. Um, and so please make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at the, the scoping meeting slides that we put out last week and sending us comments. Comments on WERP are due January 29th. Comments on the A2 STA interim operations are due January 31st. And then, of course, as you all are aware, uh, BBC and SEP operations are moving forward. So if you're not on those PDTs and you want to be, please, uh, you can come let me know today um, or reach out to our planning leads and I can give you those contacts as well. So thank you, James. Okay, now we will go to our virtual attendees and uh, Bonnie Irving. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Uh, almost, can you speak up a little louder? We can, it's very faint. Okay, how's this? Wonderful. All right. Uh, I'm Bonnie Irving. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm just looking forward to the new year and looking at a lot of progress. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Now we'll go to Dan Scheidt. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to give everybody a quick update on our regional environmental monitoring and assessment program. We successfully completed sampling. Uh, unprecedented sampling of about 40 stations in Big Cypress National Preserve in October, or sorry, September. And uh, 
the FIU labs and EPA labs have, have those samples. We're beginning to work up those data. And then in addition, we're planning for an Everglades sampling probably in September with about 100 um, locations throughout the Everglades. And uh, we're looking forward to that. And we appreciate the support of the working group and um, science coordination group for this effort through the decades. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you very much for getting that sampling completed and planned. Jed Redwine. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Jed Redwine with Seminole Show of Florida. Thanks, Jed. Um, Jennifer Hecker. Good morning, everyone. Jennifer Hecker with the Coast on Heartland National Estuary Partnership. Just have a quick announcement. I want to invite everyone to the free public Southwest Florida Climate Summit that's going to be held February 28th and 29th. We're really pleased that Assistant Secretary Estinos, Chief Resiliency Officer Brooks, and Senator Marco Ruby are going to be giving some of their keynote remarks, followed by many experts. And so we hope that you all might consider coming and spreading the word. More information can be found on our website at chnep.org. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we have Joan Browder. Hello, uh, I'm glad to be here and I appreciate the uh, Zoom opportunity to attend. I'm uh, with the South Florida <laughs> Fishery Science Center, South Southeast Fishery Science Center of the National Marine Fishery Service of NOAA. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Browder. And last is Mark Raines. Good morning, Mark Raines, Chief Science Officer for the state of Florida. First, welcome back from vacation, Lawrence. I hope we didn't drop too many balls in your absence. In any case, it's wonderful to have you back providing leadership today. Uh, I'm sorry I can't join you in person today, but I need to be virtually or physically with you and uh, today and physically elsewhere late this afternoon, so this will have to suffice. Um, I'll certainly miss some of the relationship building and back and forth conversations that happen in the face-to-face -face meeting, but I nevertheless look very much forward to the updates today, especially as they relate to the flexibility we continue to build that's better allowing us to push water south and protect water resources throughout South Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. All right, back to you. Thank you. We're going to mix it up a little bit. We're going to continue with our online participants here and do our working group. Our folks that are participating virtually are equally as important. I will start with, oh, I had a hand up. John Mayle. Thanks, James. This is John Mayle, Martin County uh, Ecosystem Restoration Division. Um, actually, no, it's now the Environmental Resources Division. We recently merged with Coastal. And so we've got a new name. Wish I could be with you in person. I'm um, thankful for the Zoom option. It's going to be a little bit of a, a running with scissors day. But I do want to introduce someone who is with you there, Dr. Elizabeth Kelly. Um, if, if you don't mind waving your hand and making your... Uh, thank you. Um, she is uh, our kind of not somewhat new um, lead on water quality issues. So feel free to, to say hi and uh, welcome welcome her if you get the chance today. A couple of things, just because it can be a little bit of a crazy day, I'll jump in on these things now. Um, we, we were grateful to be able to be at the task force meeting in November, a group from Martin County. And uh, it was a great meeting. Um, it's, it's awesome to see conversations progressing on these critical issues. But one of the things that um, we took away that was probably most poignant from some of our other meetings with agencies and delegates congressionally was that um, sometimes success can be silent. And we don't celebrate enough um, what we have accomplished. We were hearing um, quite quite often, actually, um, questions like, "Well, is it really working? You know, you guys have already got a, um, the C forty four reservoir in SCA, and and has it has it done anything for you?" We we realized we've been remiss in not being more vocal about um, how value added that's been for the St. Lucie River and estuary, and also <clears throat> it's worth noting that. Um, the, the, the Water Management District and the Corps of Engineers are due a, a, um, quite a bit of gratitude for uh, the management of the system, particularly in this last year, 
using the flexibility that LORS 08 provides to implement what we've learned in Losum, most likely spared the St. Lucie River, probably the Clusahatchee, some significant damaging discharges this year. And that's something that we need to be more vocal about. And also, you know, through this dry season so far, being able to provide some beneficial flows to Clusahatchee, that's a win that um, is as a consequence of, of, you know, some forward thinking leadership at the core in the district. And we need to be vocal about that as well. So that's all. Thank you. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you, John. Larry Williams. Hi, everybody. I'm Larry Williams. I work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm a member of the working group. It's great to see everybody this morning. Adam Brain. Good morning, everyone. Adam Brame, NOAA National Marine Fishery Service. <clears throat> I don't have any specific announcements, but I am looking forward to hearing the updates and participating in the discussion. Thanks. Becky Allenbach. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we have you. Great. Um, Becky Allenbach, EPA Senior Advisor for South Florida and Everglades Issues have a couple of quick personnel um, updates for you all, um, mainly for Adam. You may have already seen that Radhika Fox, our representative on the task force, is stepping down from EPA. And so there will be another uh, EPA representative. Technically, you know, as the listed member of the task force, Janine Gettle, the acting regional administrator, will continue to attend the meetings for that designee. And then also um, we have a new water division director coming on board for EPA in the Atlanta office um, starting at the end of January. Her name is Katie Butler. She previously worked for EPA's Office of Inspector General. Um, we're lucky to have Katie and looking forward to having her with us. And then lastly, um, Dan Scheidt texted me a moment ago. He's our science coordination group member and said that he was remiss in not recognizing Melody Naja, Eric Steveno, and the, the whole team from National Park Service, as far as our aviation division, that were instrumental in helping make sure that our remap study went off in, uh, in October. So thank you all for that collaboration. That's it, thank you so much. Thank you, Ed Smith. James, Ed Smith, DEP. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to, uh, to be here uh, virtually. Uh, just couldn't make it today because of travel issues, um, but thank you for that. Just wanted to highlight uh, an announcement that came out last week from the governor. They've released the next $10 million in innovative technologies for harmful algal bloom projects. We're really excited about these. We've got several projects in and around Lake Okeechobee that's going to benefit some of those communities there. So we're we're really looking forward to getting those projects going. And then just to highlight, you know, the governor's budget was released not too long ago, showing a record investment in, in Everglades. So we're very thankful for the support from the, the governor and the legislature for all the funding and everything that's been going on. So looking forward to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Gina Ralph. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Gina Ralph of uh, Corps of Engineers. Um, Happy New Year. Glad to be here today. I will be uh, in and out of our presentations today, but um, looking forward to it, especially the uh, agenda item on the science needs for the science coordination group. Thank you. Wes Brooks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to build off of a little bit of, of what Ed said, and I am sorry I, I'm, I'm not able to make it today, um, but I think it's really important for everyone to uh, to hear that, you know, in Florida, we are continuing to flow state investments to enable us to better flow um, clean water throughout the system. The governor's budget rec recommendations include $745 million for Everglades restoration, $330 million for targeted water quality improvements, nearly $20 million in dedicated funds for the protection of Florida's coal reef, including uh, $11.3 million for the second year of the governor's uh, wave-making Florida's coal reef restoration and recovery initiative, 
Um, and so overall, uh, the focus on Florida's future budget recommendations invests nearly $3.4 billion in Florida's environments and resilience in communities around our state. Um, so I think it's just uh, absolutely critical that that we keep up uh, the the pressure and and keep making uh, making progress, um, you know, federal and state. Um, I also want to just really quickly thank Eric uh, for taking the lead on the FCRCT presentation later today, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, next week uh, at the EAA uh, STA uh, ribbon cutting. Thank you, Wes. Lots of good news in this whip around. I like that. It's a great way to start the new year. I'll turn it to the room now. and We're going to pick up all of our members in the room. Thank all of our uh, online participants. Jennifer Reynolds. Good morning. Uh, so all the science coordination group members said, oh, I'm really looking forward to the science discussion on the agenda. It's so less satisfying to say like, oh, I'm so looking forward to the policy discussion somewhere on the agenda, right? So I, I won't say that, but, um, but I do just want to echo the momentum that um, has been discussed by some of the members online. Um, you know, this is a great time to be in Everglades restoration, right? And we say that kind of a lot, and we've kind of said that, I don't know, for the last 10 years or so, because the momentum has been building um, to a point where we're at today where um, we really are working in every segment of Everglades, from Orlando all the way to Florida Bay. There is a project, uh, either operations or construction or design or planning going on right now. And that is amazing and phenomenal. And so I have some comments that I'll share maybe later in the agenda after we talk about the projects and the programs that are being worked on by both the core and the district. Um, but I'm just really glad to be here and to be part of the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I thought you were going to kick us off with the Go Biennial Report that's coming up in the agenda. <laughs> so you get the ball rolling. Karen? Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Karen Bonesack, NOAA's Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, no, no announcements today, but I'm just happy to be here and see everybody in person, and I look forward to the agenda. Roland. Good morning. Roland Adelini, Lee County Natural Resources. Uh, please announce Lee County has just rewarded, uh, awarded over $25 million for water quality projects in the Caloosahatchee River. One of particular note is the uh, Bob Jane's Preserve, that was a 5,600 acre parcel of land we purchased through our conservation lands program. And that is to restore some of the uh, agricultural uh, activities and land uses on there and try to rehydrate some of those portions and tie that into the wetland flowways that are, are contiguous to that. And that's all part of the Babcock region and Lee County. Also, some funds are going to the um, GS10, better known as the Frank Mann Preserve Project. It's a former mine site, 640 acres. Uh, was abandoned years ago, partially mined, partially not. And what it, we're going to do is recreate some uh, meandering flowways, filter marshes, and storage. So, again, for water quality and also attenuation of flood flows. And on top of that, we received $27 million in resiliency funds for the Battery Kiker Preserve. So, we've been well blessed. And thank you for our partners at the state for uh, getting that money and chaining that money our way. Uh, we're cautiously watching the Lake Okeechobee levels right now. Uh, we are, I guess we're full blown into El Nino right now. Lee County yesterday in some parts received eight inches of rainfall. So uh, 2023, we're actually in a deficit, but we're quickly making up for that. And with the lake sitting at 16, we're really concerned about what we may see down the road when the real rains come in the summertime and if we start getting you know, the full blast of, of releases. So. Um, hoping the core and the district can do their magic and prevent that from happening. And then one last thing, uh, Ian, we're still digging out well over a year. Uh, it's amazing how much debris is still on our waterways. Uh, derelict vessels and abandoned vessels still remain issue, and there's a large process, a long process of getting those removed. Also, there's a lot of debris in wetland systems, islands, what have you. So we still got a lot of long way to go. So um, thank you all for your support during that uh, event as well. Rebecca Elliott. Good morning, Rebecca Elliott, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Very happy to be here. 
and really looking forward to this strong start in 2024 with all the projects and programs for Everglades. And I agree with Eric that we are all trying to negotiate an incredible amount of traffic on this front, whether it's on the site, the programs, the planning, the construction, the reviews. It's just been a ton of work, but really good work to get done. Um, and I found that it's actually so busy that today when I showed up, that the district headquarter parking lot is even getting full. So, <laughs> so yes, there must be a lot of work going on. Thanks. Amy. Good morning, everyone. Amy Castaneda, make a city chart. Amy Castaneda, make a city chart. Good morning. Veronica. Good morning. Happy New Year to everyone. Veronica Harold James with the U.S. Attorney's Office, Southern District of Florida, uh, here on behalf of the Department of Justice. Happy to be here in person. I'm looking forward to the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Pedro? Mm -hmm. The whole time. Now you're live. All right, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Pedro Ramos. I'm the superintendent for Everglades and Dry Tortugas National Parks. Very privileged to be able to do that work. Uh, in that role, I also oversee Big Cypress National Preserve and Biscayne National Park, uh, two places that are managed by two wonderful superintendents, uh, Tom Forsy and Penny Del Bene, respectively. Um, Happy New Year to everybody, and it's really great to be here. And Jennifer, you're absolutely right, and other members that have mentioned the incredible momentum that we are enjoying uh, nowadays. I want to thank the district, and I want to thank the core for helping us not only wrap up the year last year with a wonderful event. Uh, I saw many of you at the C43 event uh, on the West Coast, important that we focus some of our effort uh, to that side of the state, very critical. And uh, it's great that we're gonna be together uh, next week, uh, celebrating yet another time. I, Mr. Chairman, uh, after, after having sat uh, at the working group, at the task force meeting at the Yates Auditorium in Washington, D.C. in November, and listening to the significant amount of complaints and concerns that I heard around the topic of wilderness that is being worked on at Big Cypress National Preserve, I, I just feel compelled, and if I may, I'm gonna use a few minutes to share some thoughts from the perspective of my role as the manager of the largest wilderness area east of the Rocky Mountains, I have a little bit of experience uh, doing this kind of work. And uh, I just, the, the concerns, objections, many of which have been also shared with us with the department and with the, with the agency in writing, just simply don't match my day-to-day -day, uh, experience and practice in managing the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wilderness area, which is nearly a million and a half acres of land right down here in South Florida. Most of Everglades National Park is designated wilderness by Congress. The largest level of protection of the land that we have here in the United States. Most of the concerns center around the fact that people uh, somehow believe that a wilderness designation a, would prevent the agencies from doing our work, that we somehow would throw away the key and walk away from these lands. And I'm here to say that, to the contrary, uh, when lands are found to have that kind of quality here in the United States, they deserve and they require and they get the higher level of attention. At Everglades National Park, I can tell you that we are very, very engaged on wilderness lands doing research. I spoke with my team just this morning as I was driving here thinking about 
what I may say. Last year alone, we received over 100 uh, research permit applications. And only 6% of them were denied for reasons mostly other than having anything to do with wilderness. In fact, I've been told that scientists love to come in and do science in the Everglades wilderness because it's some of the most pristine land that we have in our nation, not just in Florida. Uh, other concerns have to do with how we may not be able to go in ourselves and do work around this horrible, very, very challenging job that we have in front of us to deal with exotic species of animals and plants that continue to take over the landscape down here in South Florida. And I'm here to tell you that we are very, very engaged uh, with many different partners, including the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, who have funded a significant amount of vegetation removal, exotic vegetation removal in Everglades National Park, including allowing our contractors to get into wilderness areas when we have to allow that. But it just requires a higher level of consideration. Yes, there's some additional bureaucratic steps that we have to take because again, these lands that we as a country recognize to have the highest qualities of natural resources on the land do require a little bit of a closer level of attention. Another great example is the hole in the donut. Some of you may be aware of the fact that we have a mitigation bank in Everglades National Park. It's the only one in the national park system. Let's be proud of that down here in South Florida. And we have rid thousands and thousands of acres, over 5,000 acres, from just being basically a monoculture of pepper. Those are lands that have been found to have the wilderness qualities that we're talking about here. And we not only have done that work, but we've done it with heavy equipment, the heaviest of equipment that you may see, bulldozers and, and dump trucks, scraping the landscape down to the bedrock. So, you know, I, I, I understand that wilderness is something that some people are fundamentally opposed to, and I respect that, I get it, and I'm listening. But we have to be frank and we have to be uh, accurate. And again, uh, wilderness, it's something that I would I go as far as saying that many people here in the state of Florida uh, talk to me very, very often, and they tell me about how grateful they are to have the wild landscape that we have in Everglades National Park for them to enjoy. The recreational opportunities are immense. People enjoy these lands every single day of the year, literally. Uh, but the fact is that recreational off-road vehicle or recreational mechanized equipment is not authorized in wilderness in order to protect it. That's not to say that the agency is uh, kept from doing our job with many partners, including some that are here with us around the table. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to pass it back on to you. Uh, I will say that if you haven't, before I do that, if you haven't gone to Flamingo, I've been giving Flamingo a plug now for a couple of years while I get this microphone. If you haven't gone to Flamingo, you need to do so. You're in this game, you're in this work, you are passionate about the work that we're doing, and Flamingo is back to life. We have a brand new visitor center, we have a brand new restaurant, bar, we have a brand new hotel, and an incredible amount of offerings for recreational activities for you and your families down there. So I hope to see you uh, in the park. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. We appreciate those comments. Uh, there was a, like you said, it was a lot of conversation and a lot of heavy public comment on that topic at the task force. So I appreciate you bringing those to the table. Just taking a look around the room. Let me check my Zoom, see if there's any hands up here. Our first item, Our first item on today's agenda 
is an approval of the meeting summary. So we're going to look online or around the room for a motion for the September 23rd meeting summary. Uh, Chair approved. Kennedy, DEP, I move that we approve the minutes as written. I'll second it. We'd like to take a discussion on the summary if we have any. And I'm look, just looking around the room. Watch the room for me, Lawrence. I'm going to check online here. <laughs> all right, nope. So let's have a vote in favor. We'll take a vote in favor. Um, all in the room? Aye. Aye. Online, any dissenting votes, please raise your hand. Okay, we're going to call the summary passed unanimously. Hmm. I would just like to introduce, we have a South Florida Water Management District. He's shaking his head in the back room. Governing Board Member Ben Butler has joined us. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Butler. Welcome, Mr. Butler. Adam, would you like to move us right into our Executive Director's Report? Thanks. Let's keep the ball rolling. Thanks, James. Uh, some good discussion. Um, and before I get started on this, you know, we're looking for opportunities for agenda items you know, things that are important to you all. Roland, you brought up a good topic. You know, I think it's something that maybe needs some further highlighting and discussion that while we go through all of this restoration effort, right, and getting the main flowway and water better and getting the timing distribution and quantity and quality better, you know, some of those effects of the, you know, the built environment that this water is going to pass through before it gets to our estuaries may have an effect, right, in doing some of that upfront work of restoration of, you know, modified lands uh, is is an important facet of how the 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 natural and the built environment mesh together, and how this all really you know finally plays out at the end of the day. And it's uh, it's something I think that Miami Dade County, in my view, kind of struggles with, right? Of not having some of those open landscapes, and others do it better, right? So um, anyway, um, that's really some great work to I think that needs to be highlighted uh, more more um, more more frequently. So it's good stuff. Um, anyhow, um, going right into the, the, my report here of the office, um, I'm a little bit delinquent on getting back with the task force members. They have the uh, proposed charter amendments for the working group and science coordination group. Um, hope to have something back shortly. I do need to follow up with them. That was sent out earlier before the holidays, probably bad timing before the holidays to expect much. And so I need to follow up. Um, we'll have more details on that. If there's any question any members uh, have, just let me know. We'll get that addressed um, or get the answers to you that we have at this time. Um, and if you have something to add, James, later on, please feel free on that topic or Lawrence. Um, anyhow, big reporting year for, for our office, right? But what does that mean? We can't do it without your all support, right? It's um, as kind of just kind of the, the hunter gatherers and you guys are really the, the, the tip of the spear of each of the agencies. The biennial report effort um, will begin April, mark that down, April. Um, and this is really, and we're trying to shoot for the one in October to, to be done in October. Um, and then um, this is the only one to be reported to task force. So obviously we're trying to get this done in a, in a place be, to be ready for task force um, next October in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the, the IFP, again, um, the 2024 IFP effort will begin in May. I repeat that in May, April, May. So it's going to be happening. Uh, project sheets, this is a tremendous amount of effort. It represents 250 state and federal, tribal, and local government restoration projects that contribute to the task force three, that contribute to the task force three strategic goals. Um, anyway, most of this information is, is on here and can be referenced at a later time. Um, the crosscut budget is congressionally required as well. Um, this effort will begin in March um, for targeted completion in, in late May. Right, so um, that's a pretty big effort that is comprehensive that speaks to, um, you know, the budget requests of ecosystem restoration efforts. So really, really appreciate all of your all support and, you know, from from uh, an additional item here that um, I'd like to um, an update on the ecological indicators that um, correlates to our reporting process. Laura, would you please provide some additional clarity? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Adam. 
Um, I'm Laura Brandt. I've been coordinating uh, reporting on ecological aspects within the biennial report. And since 2012, I guess it is. And this has been done both within the context of the report, but also as a separate standalone, what you guys may remember as the system-wide ecological indicators for Greater Everglades. Every year that I've worked on this, I've tried to make improvements to the reporting to make it more efficient and effective. I've brought before this group discussions about the effectiveness of the report, what you would like to see, how we can make it better. Well, we have a really good opportunity this year to take a big step in that efficiency and effectiveness because it's also the year that there are a bunch of other reports going on. The Recover System Status Report, which Phyllis will talk about, Phyllis Klarman will talk about later. Um, the COP Biennial Report, the South Florida Environmental Report, and the Everglades National Park World Heritage Report. All of those are speaking in some way to the ecological success of restoration. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do four separate reports that are completely disconnected. So I've been talking with Marsha about how we can better improve the biennial reporting and incorporate the ecological responses throughout the report, as well as in the separate section on restoration science. So this year, we're going to make some changes to, uh, it's going to be minor in terms of the whole overall report, but it, it's going to be more directed in terms of the questions that we're asking when we, we seek information. We want to characterize the projects um, by status towards completion. So we know where we might be expecting ecological responses versus where we're not quite there yet. We want to be more explicit about the discussion of ecological responses at the project level, but at the same time linking that with what's going on in the entire ecosystems. Um, we want, we'll be incorporating the ecological indicators into the section that was last year, last time called the Everglades Restoration Science instead of having it as an appendix at the end. So again, it'll be more comprehensive, showing better how our investments are leading to these ecological outcomes that we're looking for. We're not going to do a standalone system-wide ecological indicators report as we've done in the past because Recover is doing their five-year report and a lot of that same information overlaps. So we'll be, I've been coordinating with Recover, I'm also on the Recover Executive Committee, um, been coordinating with Recover and with the scientists on how we do this to make it most efficient and, and effective. Um, We'll, so we'll be referencing that report, the South Florida Environmental Report, the COP Biennial Report, um, and the, the uh, World Heritage Report as necessary to create that more comprehensive picture of, what, of what's going on. And so the benefits of doing it this way is we have more focused information on the outcomes of our, our investments. So we'll be able to look at where we're seeing the ecological responses that we expect based on, on the status of the projects. It's gonna give us this integration among reports so that our messaging is consistent across the same information um, so that we're all looking at the same time frame when we're saying that we, we have a response. And it will also reduce everyone's workload because a lot of times the same people are working on the same reports. And so by having this coordination at the front end, we can share information among the reports um, and make every, like I said, make everybody's, except for Marsha and my life's easier. So um, as you see the request from Marsha, look for some additional direction on the kinds of information we're looking for in those summaries that you've done in the main parts of the report. I've also been working with Amanda Kahn at the district who's been working with the project managers to try to help make this, this better integration. So, um, it's, it's, as you guys have said, this is an exciting time, and I think it's an exciting time in terms of reporting on um, what we're getting in terms of our, our investments. Thank you, Laura. Um, I would like to, to say kudos. Thank you, Laura. I know you have been working tirelessly to try to get the reporting 
in a fashion that it is understandable, it meets its objective, um, it helps us move forward in, in restoration. I think that asking the question of what is the status of a project is so important because we don't want to report just for the sake of reporting. Um, we want to say, hey, where are we in, the, in this project? Have we put enough in the ground to actually have a change in a driver that's gonna drive an ecological response? So we, we often get kind of wrapped around the axle of, if you look at it from a very high level, oh, all these projects are in the ground and, and they want a report card, you know, Congress, and they want to say, what is, what is going on? And there might not be any positive response yet, but it might not be time for a positive response yet. There might even be a period of time where one project elicits a negative response until it works in concert with three other projects. So how we report our science is incredibly important. I think this is a great step in trying to coordinate all of the different reporting that is done and do it in a fashion that someone can pick it up and say, oh, they're only X far along. I don't expect a response, but look at this other project that has produced the appropriate hydrology. We have removed you know, aspects of the ecology that's gonna be negative and we're seeing a, neg a positive response. So it really helps identify where we are and what we actually anticipate and then grade it. And then we can have discussions on what might need to change operationally or whatever to try to meet those target endpoints. So I think it's a fantastic move forward. Jennifer? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Lawrence is saying, because I think this is a really great example of why having the working group and the science coordination group come together on this kind of thing is so important because oftentimes I think we rely on the scientists to have to interpret how to not only interpret the science, but then wrestle with communicating the policy potential implications. And this group has the great opportunity right now to allow the scientists to report the science and then the policy folks can wrestle with how do we communicate um, exactly what Lawrence was just saying, that we're seeing what we expected, but it might not be what people want to see at this stage. And those are two different things, right? We, we might absolutely be seeing what we expected, but it's not really a, a positive response or it's not a significant enough response for what people policy people might be expecting to see, right? Policy people want to see easy results. Science isn't easy, right? Policy people want to see if we've put 50% of the funding forward, we want to see a 50% over the response, right? That's what policy people want to see. And um, the working group members have the opportunity to help um, keep the science folks focused on the science while we wrestle with how to communicate that even though you've put 50% of your money in, you're not going to see 50% of the response until 20 years from now or whatever, right? And, and being able to um, help communicate that. So I really appreciate this discussion um, and this opportunity for us to collaborate together. Thanks, Jennifer. Anyone else? Then Adam, I'd like to just jump in and yeah, um, we've, we've worked a lot on this. We've talked a lot about this. And I'd just like to point out a few themes that have talked in here in this conversation and from Laura herself. Uh, Laura, I appreciate the work you've put on this. We've talked all the way back on, probably back to 2021 or 22 about this. It was identi re reporting efficiencies. Reporting efficiencies was identified on one of our earlier uh, priority exercises we did in this group. and. Um, we've continued to make progress on it, but here's the time in which we identified at that time to kind of bring this full circle and kind of make that big step because of the way the reporting that you mentioned line up. But also coming around this conversation and meetings together and commu improve communication and putting the science forward. Thank you for folks that are in the weeds on putting the science forward. Um, a lot of the things that we've talked about in those priority setting meeting conversations we had are coming forward in this and I appreciate you for helping us out with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, James. You know, uh, Laura, before uh, the meeting, I was uh, speaking with Major Major Bell, 
and just had some hypothetical stuff of responses, but it's really important to get that story right and not have hypothetical what I think is going on, right? From what I see from being out there in the park, it's probably remotely different than what it actually is and being able to tell that side of the story accurately and carry that message is extremely important. So um, thank you for that update. Um, and so I'm um, not seeing really any other comments, questions, I guess people can get with you, Laura, afterwards or what have you uh, regarding this. So uh, and any members uh, later on during the uh, um, last agenda item can speak to this uh, indicator species topic that's extremely important. Um, and the next topic that I'm going to be talking about um, implementing Section 504, the WERDA 20 invasive species risk assessment prioritization and management. Actually, we've tied it to the indicator species as well or indicators um, on this. And so um, we're going to go back and, and take a look at this and, you know, the invasive species, we also was talking with uh, Major Bell as well. We had a full hour before and you know, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, invasive species was one of those, right? While doing restoration, it's really important that we not lose sight of the invasion, the, the invasion curve and invasive species uh, on the landscape. Um, and, and a dedicated group of um, on this advisory, uh, this advisory group, um, really second to none, uh, have stayed uh, dedicated uh, through this process. Um, of um, producing work, uh, work effort, recommendations, and priority listings uh, in very difficult portions of the invasion curve. Um, and we're, I'm kind of revisiting this because we do have some new members and just, and also for the public to be aware of this, new members of the public as well. Uh, the invasion curve is a, is a really um, interesting um, um, chart and graph to use and understand the invasion curve and, and the importance of you know, um, investing at the, uh, you know, prior to those in horizon scanning. Um, so anyway, we've it's convened the, um, the advisory body and it's split into two parts as described here. This is nothing new to this group. Um, and so um, the work product to this point, um, next slide, please. Um, it used a ground up approach uh, involving evasive species experts that I spoke about. Um, again, the initial assessment method, horizon scanning, there's a link at the bottom there. Uh, it's kind of hiding down there in yellow a little bit. Uh, but this was the basically two pager, it's actually one page front and back, um, that kind of describes the um, prioritization of um, invasion, invasive species there. So um, it's going to be, uh, the priority list is going to be uh, a prevention on the landscape and those recommendations contained there for how to how to begin to address this. This is not a final document. The list is not final. It's going to be something that's going to be continually um, updated and, and revisited. Um, and so um, the horizon scanning combines risk screening, consensus building to prioritize invasive species threats based on arrival likelihood and negative ecological and socioeconomic impacts. Next slide. So um, the next steps of where this group is, is it, it's kicking off the prioritization process of EDRR and established species. Um, and linking this to key indicators of restoration success, right? That's kind of the new, the new um, area, or the direction that we were, or the group was decided to take. I say we, them, right? It's kind of advising uh, us here um, and looking kind of for any input that you all may have during this process. Um, so anyway, it's a living list. This is just an update. The next meeting that this group will be having um, we'll be at the end of the month, January 29th, um, from the various state and federal agencies. I really can't uh, thank you all enough here, those that are involved, um, those that have members of your team involved um, on this topic. Um, really, um, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's a really monumental task. So um, if any members have any activities that they have planned at their agencies, recommendations for the next couple of years, anything that needs to be brought forward to this group that may not be aware to the advisory body, to the working group SCG task force that um, maybe needs to be highlighted a little bit more, please share. That's probably part of, um, you know, I always talk about communication, communication, communication um, is um, really the paramount, um, you know, hurdle uh, to communicate what we're seeing out there and our teams are doing. Um, any questions, let me know. Um, but that's it for the update. Thank you, Adam. Let's look around the room for questions and online. Not seeing any hands up online in the room. 
James, um, yeah, and um, there has been some question lastly. Uh, task force will be is down here in South Florida. Um, it is confirmed for uh, April 25th. Um, and just working out some of the finer details before it gets, um, you know, um, just meeting location, the exact timing and beyond just the 25th. So there have been some questions uh, because of what was shared at task force and I'm trying to clear that up now. And so the next meeting is on the 29th. Uh, for the next meeting for this group is on the 29th. There has been a good engagement. I know at the last meeting, um, several of the co-chairs were on that call on that Zoom for the last meeting. And before the April task force, there'll probably be a couple of meetings of this group, I think. So that'll be good timing. And just last check around the room. Thank you very much, Adam. We'll roll right into agenda item number five, Army Corps of Engineers uh, program and project updates. Welcome in Eva Valles. You may. Good morning. Is that you, Ms. Marsha, who's going to be clicking for me? Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, members of the working group, members of the science coordination group. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you about our progress in uh, South Florida ecosystem restoration and uh, central and southern Florida resilience. Next slide, please. Ava, could you bring the microphone a little closer, please? Thank you. Is this better? Better, thank you. Okay. So I'd like to do this brief a little bit different than normal with your okay, because we had so much time together in November. And this is a lot of the same information that I presented at the task force in November. Everyone went away for the holidays. We had a little bit of time in January. And we've done a lot of incremental tasks since November, but I wanted to take today to talk about our priorities for 2024. Because as you see up here on the screen, we have many actions that are moving forward. And what I hear all the time as your program manager for the core is how do I think of all this at the same time? How do you think about this at the same time? How do you organize it in your mind? How do you help others understand it? So I did a lot of uh, reflecting on this over the holidays, and I did write up six priorities for 2024 that I wanna share with all of you as we think through this program together. So this is a visual representation of how all the projects fit together. And if you look on the upper right, you'll see it says Central and Southern Florida Project, and what I wanna highlight for you is everything we do from a programming and project and implementation perspective starts with the CNSF federal project. I get this question quite a bit. So the way that the Everglades restoration program is organized from a programming perspective, from a funding perspective, from a breakdown of tasks perspective for the core starts with that upper right. So think of this as a program org chart. And it's color coded. So there's quite a bit that's under design and construction, which is the gray. We have completed some projects which are in operations. And you can notice that there are under SERP, right? SERP is a modification to the CNSF. You see all the generations of projects under it. And then to the right, the bottom right, you see our studies, which are the next set of generations. So, so that's how to think of this from a programming and funding perspective. You see HHD and LACO over on the middle left, which are kind of on their own because they are not SERP, but they're an integral part of the system. And then you see over on the upper right, the new part, which is resiliency. Next slide, please. So as you look at 
our fiscal year 24 execution, we have all at the same time, all moving forward, program level activities, we have planning, we have design and construction, and we have operations and maintenance. And some of these we do together, meaning like in this group, we all work on, we all work with the National Academy of Sciences on CISREP. Primarily the core and the water management district and DOI work in the interagency modeling center. And if you see the color coded design and construction, you can see that many of our projects we do together. So that's unique in the nation for the Corps of Engineers that the sponsor can build right next to us is incredibly unique. So then how do we think of this when all of this is happening all at the same time? How do we prioritize it? How do we make sure that we advance? So here's my thoughts for you to think about today. Instead of me going slide by slide by slide by slide today, we're not going to do that if that's okay with you. Because I can answer any follow up questions. You can pull up any slide you want. We can do a Q&A. But instead of that, as you look at this slide, here's what my priorities are. Here's what I want you to be thinking about for 2024. It doesn't mean that not every single one of these things will advance. But here's the priorities of how to think about it. Number one, award construction contracts for a total of 3.1 billion. That's with a B. That's what's on just the core side for 2024. That means the embankment for the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir Indian River Lagoon South, C23, C24 North Reservoir, SEP South S356 Pump Station, SEP South S355 West Spillway, that's on Tamiami Trail, Broward County Water Preserve Area C11 Impoundment. Those are five large construction contracts the Corps is scheduled to award in 2024. Number two, prepare documents to consider by the Congress and Water Resources Development Act of 2024. We have four jointly with South Florida. Western Everglades, Lake Okeechobee Watershed Wetlands Report, supporting our sponsor in their Section 203 report for Lake Okeechobee Component A Reservoir, LOCAR, and an update to the total project cost of Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands. We're almost done with that one in construction, but we've got some updating to do. Number three, realize ecosystem benefits through operations. So that's at the bottom right there, but not just by itself, right? Examples of this is the deviation of the combined operations plan completing LOSIM, continuing through the testing phase of C44 Reservoir and Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, increment one of Kissimmee, SEP operational planning, SEP EAA stormwater treatment area. So it gets overwhelming if you think of them one by one, but if you remember that the priority is realizing benefits through operations, that's what our collective goal would be here is how do we think about it? Remember that that's a goal that we jointly have. Number four, advance the next generation of projects. So these are things like BBC or the CNS, CNSF 216 study, making sure we make the next set of milestones. BBC or round three modeling. Y'all are probably all overwhelmed with the level of detail that's being presented to you right now. There's another meeting this week, right? So, but, but really what we're doing is we're advancing the next generation of projects. And so that's BBC here, the CNSF 216. We're gonna start Southern Everglades. 
and we've got a SERP update that we're continuing to work on. Number five, communicate openly with our sponsors, partners, and tribes and stakeholders. We've got some specific actions that we wanna improve there. And number six is maintaining visibility on cost through design and construction. That's a program manager's bread and butter, but it's important because if we're successful in managing cost, then we get to do more projects. So I said a lot. I've got one more thing I wanna show you. Uh, next slide, please. I think it should be the budget. Just to highlight our annual appropriation for fiscal year 24 plus some of our carryover makes a fiscal year 24, the current fiscal year budget of about 500 million. Together with the BIL funds of 1.1 billion, we, based on everything I just talked about, those big five awards and everything else we're doing, we are very well positioned to execute all of that this year. We continue to try to get additional funding for our CNSF flood resiliency study. And we understand that the president will release his budget around March. And so with that, I'll pause and take any questions instead of going all through all, every single slide. I'm gonna look around, let's go around the table for questions and I'll look online for hands. Thank you for the pause and the great detail of information. Seeing none at this time. <laughs> Ava, I'll, I'll bring a question for you. You mentioned several several funds the core is looking to let out this year. You, you, you rattled off three or four of them offhand, and some of them big dollars. Uh, out of those four you mentioned, what are are there any, it, does one of them do any, what's the most challenging one? What's gonna be the most challenging one for that for 2024, do you think? You know, the, the challenge that we're seeing, and it isn't a larger or smaller challenge for any of the, we've got five large construction awards. It's that we have a very competitive uh, industry, a market. And so having predictability of what's going to happen every time you put something out for solicitation and for bidding. And the fact that we are doing this next to our sponsor, who's also putting a bunch of work out, the market is incredibly competitive. And so one of our goals in communication is to partner with industry in a way that's more transparent so that we can uh, learn from them and improve the way that our solicitations go. That's one of the big challenges we have. And when you say competitive, still getting responses to the requests, the competitive is on, the, on that side is what you mean by competitive. Well, when like, you are soliciting let's say something that may be hundreds of millions of dollars which that's where we're at in this program there's not a lot of teams that can do that work so there's a lot of partnering that has to happen and that comes with it a smaller number of bidders All if right, that makes you. sense it does make sense thank yeah. you Not seeing any other further questions. Just check online real quick. No hands up online. Thank you very much, Ava. Thank you. That might be the first time and I'm under time. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mindy Parrott. She's the South Florida Water Management District SERP Pro Program Manager, and uh, she's going to provide us the South Florida Water Management Project update. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here again and give you another update. I'm Indy Parrott. 
Um, I did have to come up because I just can't see the screen <laughs> very well without my glasses on. So um, happy new year, everybody. Um, it has been a really busy um, 2023 and um, we will have a likely a very busy 2024 as Ava was just talking about from the course perspective. Hopefully what um, I'll tell you about today will let you know what's going on on our end as well. Just a quick reminder, we are the non-federal sponsor for the core on the um, federal projects, the SERP foundation projects and the resiliency projects as well. But we also have a number of state and local projects that we do um, to address um, storage, interim storage and water quality um, in the Everglades and um, northern estuaries and, and Okeechobee basins. So for 2023, I, I just took a look back, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, we presented a task force. What what happened this year? And so I went back and I looked at all of our press releases and projects and wow, we we did a lot of work. And Jen Reynolds, if you recognize some of these bullets, some of them came from you from one of your emails about um, all the great work and effort we did at the district this year. And so, um, you know, we broke ground in the EAA reservoir with the core. The Caloosahatchee Reservoir is back on track and um, will be hopefully substantially completed by the end of 2024. Um, and, and in December, we celebrated the pump station completion um, for the reservoir. We began construction of SEP North and Biscayne Bay Cutler Wetland Restoration. There's new seepage barriers in place between the national park and the built environment. There's new dispersed water management projects going on. We started and finished the Taylor Slough Improvement Project. Um, and we continued to advance both above ground and below ground storage north of Lake Okeechobee. In addition, um, with DEP, we acquired 11,000 acres um, as part of the green heart of the Everglades. So what do we got going on in 24? Um, we've got three components of SERP coming um, to substantial completion pretty soon. That's the EASTA. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, there's an event next week on the 25th to celebrate uh, ribbon cutting for the uh, cell, first cell completion out there. Um, also the seepage barrier, SEP new water seepage barrier five mile project. Um, as you'll see later slide, that's um, is a little ahead of schedule. So that's that's fantastic. And also later this year, SEP North, the first component of that that part of SEP um, will be coming to completion. And then we've also got five projects listed here um, that we look to start construction on very soon in 2024. That's the um, A2 Reservoir Pump Station for the EAA and the Indian River Lagoon South C2324 South Reservoir, as well as the C25 Reservoir and SCA projects. Um, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, the last contract, last major contract for Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands will be starting very soon. The WERP um, L28 South gated culverts and some work for the um, S8 pump station related to SEP North. And as Eva mentioned, we are working very hard to get the next round of projects through to Word of 24. Um, Locar, as mentioned, north of Lake Okeechobee Component A Reservoir, uh, Western Everglades Restoration Project, and Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project. So speaking of Locar, um, if you haven't seen this slide before, I've shown it a few times, um, but we did complete the release of the draft and are working on the final, which will be delivered to the ASA in February. I mentioned aquifer storage and recovery. Um, we are partnering with the ERDIC, the Engineer Research Development Center, part of the Army Corps. In a few weeks, our governing board will consider the agreement and funding of that work for the next, um, I guess it's about three years of research. 
we, the Water Management District, recently completed the uh, wells on the um, C38 north and south, and we're drilling on the L63 north. This picture shows a um, special samples that were collected for the Arctic research team um, and had to be contained in water to avoid exposure to air for some of their science. So I don't understand that, but it is it's kind of cool. Um, later this year, we'll also be uh, updating the science plan. So um, more to come for ASR. Um, and Western Everglades Restoration Project, uh, the draft report is out and uh, we will be having those NEPA meetings this week. So there's a lot going on there, but also um, we are entering into a pre-partnership credit agreement with the Corps so that we can begin construction on the three, um, I don't know if you can see that, but the three uh, circled white um, features, which are gated culverts in the L28 South Levy. Um, those that was authorized by the governing board in December. And so we look forward to getting that underway very soon. We also are working on beginning design for the additional culverts under Tamiami Trail Loop Road and 11 Mile Road. So that water that we send through the culverts and um, through the later parts of WARP will con continue to move through uh, Big Cypress, the western parts of Everglades National Park, and into the coastal areas of the park. On the Indian River Lagoon, I mentioned that we are um, in design and are looking to award the first contracts for the C25, which is located um, at the northern part of St. Lucie County. And the L28, I'm sorry, the C2324 South Reservoir, which is the purple um, label, the blue blob right there off of State Road 70. So with that, um, you know, later this year, we'll have all of the features of phase one of Indian River Lagoon under construction. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then we'll start talking about phase two. So more to come. And as I mentioned, and I think I showed these pictures last time, um, these are um, photos from the C43 Reservoir. The work continues out there. And I believe we are looking at something like substantial completion by the end of the calendar year. Um, more to come there. For Central Everglades is a picture of the leveling at the SEP EASCA. If you come out to the event next week, you'll see that. Um, we'll be starting to um, pump water into there so that the uh, plants can grow in and get that ready to go. And um, as Angie mentioned, we are um, looking to have some interim operations so we can make best use of that feature before the reservoir is completed. Also at our December governing board, the um, approval to start the work on the North New River Canal improvements. So the two canal improvement projects will help us bring the water from Lake Okeechobee to the reservoir and STA system. And both, all of those will be um, in construction by next year. So up north, I mentioned S620. Um, that work might be completed by um, sometime this summer. And we are in design for the remaining features and are um, looking forward to um, completing those designs and getting that work started. The new, new water seepage barrier um, is almost done um, the trenching as you see in the middle picture where the trenching is 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 dug that is all complete and um, we are in the phase of, of in putting in the cement bentonite wall and that is over 90 percent complete as of um, before christmas so um, that work is full speed ahead and um, looking forward to celebrating that one later this year Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, last year we started on S701, um, which was contract 6A, is the pump station that will bring the water from the C1 Canal to the uh, coastal mangrove system um, next to Biscayne Bay. Um, at the December Governing Board, our, our board authorized approval of the contract, the last contract, um, to construct the remaining features that will 
bring that water over to the coast from that pump station. Loxahatchee, uh, we're making progress on the designs for uh, Cypress Creek and uh, Gulfstream, I think Gulfstream East or West, I get those confused, sorry. Um, and also with Flowway to the C18 impoundment. In the meantime, we are also working on veg management for those sites to get those, those um, properties ready and um, control invasive exotics on those sites so that they're ready for the restoration when, when we're ready to get out there. So on to restoration strategies. Um, the projects that are boxed in red on the screen are the ones that are still technically in the construction phase. Those are SCA-1 West, C-139 FEB, and the STA-5-6, technically the uh, earthwork is all done there. We're in the grow-in period for the STA. Um, work is continuing and the um, making good progress on the FEB at the C-139 basin, you see in the picture. And we're looking forward to having that completed or substantially completed by the end of the calendar year. So some of the highlights from our um, state and local projects, we had um, kicked off last year, the um, Four Corners Rapid Infiltration Project, we had the ribbon cutting, and we're seeing um, better than expected benefits on a number of these projects. And we're also making um, good progress with the Sam Jones Abiyaki Prairie wetland restoration, which is over 6,800 acres of restoring a former citrus grove to a um, mixed wet prairie and marsh system on the western shore of the Everglades. So with that, I will take any questions. Do we have any questions in the room? Roland. It is really exciting attending the uh, ribbon cutting for the C-43 pump station. Um, been in this long enough to remember when they said this project would never be completed. And, and sometimes we probably felt that way, but it was, you know, once the construction started, uh, we were ex really excited to see this move forward. And we're certainly very thankful to the governing board, executive director Bartlett and staff for getting this thing back on track. I think it's, it's wonderful. We, we can't wait to see this thing operating eventually down the road. So thank you so much. Another thing you brought up, local projects. I know the district also engages in local initiatives or regional initiatives in certain counties. Perhaps sometimes on these agendas, maybe we'll take a look at some of the, what is going on to a more of a local level and how that coordinates with the bigger picture of some of these larger state and federal uh, initiatives. That's a great idea. Are there additional questions in the room? James, do you see anybody online? I do not have any hands up online. I will say excellent presentation and excellent photos of all that activity. The ribbon cuttings are, are exciting events, definitely. Mm -hmm. Last call for folks online. Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Minnie. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. A little schedule, so we're going to we're going to have an audible here and call Eric Stabino up for our Florida Core Reef Coordination Team, and that's going to adjust our after lunch schedule. So any of our participants that are either in the room or attendees online that are here for a public comment period, the public comment period may come a little bit earlier than scheduled. Eric? Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, up here to... We... Uh, Newton, Newton, Newton Cook was asking a question. Newton, we have a public comment period from uh, 2 to 3 o'clock scheduled.
Uh, Newton, it, on the agenda, we had planned for one one comment period, sir. And so um, I know that was for two o'clock, and that might been, we spent a lot of time thinking about that before the meeting. Um, and so if we just have it for that one period, if you don't mind. Thank you. Let's go to Eric. Eric? Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm here today to talk about Florida's Coral Reef Coordination Team. Wes Brooks is available with us online to, uh, you know, if I need to phone a friend. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, a few slides to cover. Um, I like to say it's been a really, was a really great year. You know, we're in January now. I can look back at 23 and see that we stood up this new team and we uh, had our kickoff meeting in just February 14th of 2023. Um, and we managed to do a series of regular meetings after that and uh, overall fairly successful, I would say a very successful first year for this team, bringing together um, all the appropriate uh, voting and non-voting members to uh, put together the work we were doing, um, working on our water quality database systems and making sure that we understand a lot about the, uh, uh, about how we're going to I would say the administration of how we're going to work for Florida's coral reef and connecting these issues with the restoration program as a whole here. Um, our next meeting will be in March 24. We're aiming to be in conjunction with the working group science coordination group. We're looking at some sort of a hybrid meeting in Long Key Nature Center. We're going to have more information available of that online and everybody's restoration.gov FCRCT. So for those of you inclined or interested, you can check us out online. Um, so to be really brief about this, we have progress to date. Um, one of the big topics of the year was to develop a database of relevant water quality and related monitoring programs. Um, essentially what we wanted to do is we wanted to look across the system and see what was being done already and start to analyze that. And then we wanted to expand on that. The water quality database is of course, I think an easier area to start on than say a biological or ecological indicators database. Um, those were the next item inside our monitoring framework that we needed to look at. And then after we're doing that and we understand what is being collected, we start to think about what's next in terms of what is needed to be connected, uh, collected. So we uh, were very carefully working our way forward on that. We finalized the monitoring framework document that has a number of priorities and actions associated with that. We've been careful to coordinate those efforts with our partners um, in all of the various agencies that are involved here. Uh, our next steps will be to continue to work forward on that action plan on the items in there, particularly the first three items on that list and uh, work on that coordination with Florida Coral Reef Resilience Program, particularly our water quality team. Um, we have a broad range of voting members you see on the bottom left a vacancy on the chart there for FDP. Um, we are filling that. We do anticipate that we'll have presence available within the PDTs on all of the major recover projects that are moving forward so that we're watching for the coral reef related issues as they're being developed within the projects right as we're looking at ecological indicators and performance metrics. So that's the, uh, the kind of the next step that you'll see us or our faces available and connecting across the projects on uh, within that. I'll leave that up for just a second for you to scroll through there because I believe we are pushing for just one last slide, which is to say, do we have any questions about what we've been doing with the team? It's a very brief meeting today. Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, you may, sir. My partner. So thanks, Eric. Uh, really important work. Uh, last year, we lost 99% of a species of reef in Dry Tortugas National Park. Yes, yeah, we had a significant tough, hit at dry tortugas that we did not. Um, we something very tough to recover from, uh, something that our staff was just baffled with and devastated about. Uh, this is a real problem for Florida, uh, not just for our national parks or the National Marine Sanctuary in the Keys. And I appreciate the work that the team is doing. My question slash comment is, uh, whether we are consulting with or interacting uh, in one way or another with neighboring countries that are also dealing with this kind of problem. Uh, 
I had the ability and the privilege to participate in a in the in the fifth Marine World Heritage Site Managers Conference in Denmark in October, and I've gone to some of these sort of things uh, in the past. And what's always eye-opening to me is that no matter where you look, yes, it's a different country. Uh, the problems are the same. Uh, the experiences are, are, are oftentimes a little different. And there's a lot to be said about learning from each other. And I don't think that I'm suggesting that we go as far as Denmark. <laughs> uh, but I know that uh, our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean and in other places nearby are also grappling with the same problem. And there may be some benefit to, I don't know if, if we would include them in in the advisory uh, role in the roster somehow or how we do it, that's for you guys to to decide and consider, but it's, it is a strong suggestion that I wanted to make. All right, great, greatly appreciated. So one of the areas of coordination we try to work at for the Park Service for us um, is through our regional office. So we're always working to make sure that we're thinking about, and that reaches out to the coral reef in our park units through the Caribbean. So it is the place where we really are dealing with some of our international partners much closer down there. I'm gonna punt this to either Wes or even Gil here in the room if you'd like to bring up a little bit of information on how we work in that environment. Um, one second, Gil. Wes, are you online? And would you like to step uh, in on this? I am. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And uh, thank you, Superintendent, for that suggestion. Um, I just, uh, I believe that the, uh, coral reef disease team through the state of Florida and through NOAA really has been taking a leadership role um, in ensuring that uh, specifically our Caribbean partners, but I know also um, even some of our Pacific partners now are getting geared up um, specifically around the, the the coral disease in particular, which has, has really been um, a, a pretty bad event over the last couple of years. Um, so some of those international partnerships are already um, in the works, um, though we haven't contemplated doing that through this specific group, which is really geared around the, the you know, Everglades region itself. All right, and I'll toss this over to Gail as well. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Um... You know, it's a, there's been so much going on with corals. It's a little little tough to keep the, the sequence straight. But um, I can say that we, as Wes mentioned, we do have a Caribbean coordination team set up as part of the response framework to the stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, so there's been a lot of good communication there. Unfortunately, that disease has found, been found throughout the wider Caribbean. Um, I've talked to my counterparts in the USVI and they have stony coral tissue disease. They had a real bad bleaching year like we did, but their ecosystems are starting from a better place. Um, in Florida, we're sort of at, uh, as was mentioned, this sort of phase shift into the community that folks remember from 25, 30 years ago to something else. We don't quite know what that something else will look like, but it's clear we're moving into something very different from what people are used to historically, whereas our partners in the Caribbean have a really good shot at maintaining a lot of that ecosystem structure and function, given that they start from a healthier place as a community. But they have a lot less resources to monitor and respond to events than we do. Um, so we're doing our best to work with them, give them advice, give them support where we can, uh, but no question, a lot of commonality uh, in terms of impacts to coral reefs in Florida and the wider Caribbean right now. And I think that really emphasizes the point of resilience. So when we're looking at this coral reef effort here in Florida now and looking at how we're coordinating with the Everglades Restoration Program, we've been focusing on water quality as the significant nexus that can help us improve the overall ecological condition at the reef and at the connected reef ecosystems. So the seagrass beds and the mangrove shorelines and looking at how we can get to a better, more resilient state. Admittedly, 
thinking that we're in a, a transitional period for our reef, we're still looking at how we can develop the most resilient environment out there so that those impacts that we're likely to see in the future, those impacts can be handled and recover, recover from quicker than we have in the past. And so we're, we're, uh, we have that focus on resilience. Open for additional questions. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm looking online just to see if we have any questions online for you. Sounds like the team is making excellent progress, though. Yeah, it's been a very exciting year. A little heartbreaking along the way, too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. And again, we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, Phyllis, would you be willing to come up early? We're going to roll into our recover topic. While they're, they're loading up the presentation. And as we said earlier, for the folks online, anybody participating in this here for the public comment period, that period will be moving up a little bit today. I don't think it affects folks in the room. We have one card in the room, and we'll take that as our first public comment uh, when we start the public comment period after lunch. And after lunch, we will be. After lunch, we'll be having the open discussion on future science topics. Adam, I'll take this time to say thank you to your team. They're loading the presentation now for keeping that all together and getting us set up for today's meeting. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, everybody, can you all hear me okay in the mic? Perfect. Um, thanks for your patience on that. Um, thank you, Marcia, for entertaining. I sent like a last minute typo revision, so she got the most up to date slides on the screen for y'all. Um, so uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Phyllis Klarman. I am the Recover Program Manager for the South Florida Water Management District. Um, my counterpart, Gina Ralph, um, the Program Manager from the Army Corps is on the line today. And I wanna thank you on behalf of the Recover um, 2024 System Status Report Task Team who has been working diligently to plan our next um, major report for this year. Um, it was alluded to earlier um, when Adam and, and Laura was speaking about how Recover's reporting may fit into the larger context of system-wide reporting and other reports that are being developed in parallel. So I just wanted to cover today what we're planning for the Recover side and then address any questions you may have either about our approach or how we're coordinating with the other reports. So first, just a recap on Recover's reporting requirements. So per the CERT programmatic regulations from 2003, Recover is required to prepare a technical report no less than every five years on whether the goals and the purposes of the SERP are being achieved or are likely to be achieved, including interim goals and interim targets. And I'll explain what those are in a subsequent slide if you're not already familiar. Um, the interim goals and interim targets are the specific tool that are established in the SERP Pro regs for evaluating the restoration success of the, the SERP or the plan. 
Um, and the Recover Monitoring and Assessment Plan, otherwise known as the MAP, which I may refer to in the slides today, um, is the primary tool by which we're actually observing changes in the ecosystem um, in real life to be able to bring that back to um, assessing performance um, to SERP implementation as those projects are in the ground. And so a quick overview of our system status reports passed. So on the screen here, I just have some of the title uh, covers for our past reports, uh, 2006, 2009, 2012, 2014, and 2019. And in 2019, we also, for the first time, um, created a communication document called the Everglades Report Card. Um, and this was meant to be a high level communication tool that we were able to use to give an overall assessment and score, so to speak, for how the Everglades is doing. Um, and what's unique about the previous reports and what we're attempting in this next report is that all previous reports were based on an ecosystem where CERT projects weren't in the ground yet. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to assess in terms of CERT project performance um, in the ecosystem. And this time around, we are in a position where there will be several project components that are um, partially or are operational. And there's also been changes in the system with several operational plans. So Lake Okeechobee system operating manual, combined operational plan or COP, for example. And so as we were moving into this new phase, so to speak, of SERP, where not only where we have uh, projects that are still in the planning phase, but we now have some that are also in the operations phase, um, we are trying to figure out how to best communicate this information, since this is our first time that we'll be really um, fulfilling those PROREG requirements, as I previously showed. And so for the system status report present, Something else we wanted to do that's a little bit different this time is focus on the key audience members for our report. So each of our previous reports um, exceeded several hundred pages, was highly technical, and something we wanted to do with this report was go back to basics and figure out who's the target audience for this. And Recover did a lot of time thinking about this, and we looked back at the ProReg's language and determined that the audience for this report is really Congress, as some of this information gets rolled up into the five-year report to Congress, um, our agency leadership, and the CERT project managers. And so something we wanted to do is figure out how to tailor our information in a way that's most beneficial for those audiences, um, keeping in mind that they may not have time or interest in reading a 300-page tech document. Um, the reporting period for this system status report will be water year 2018 through water year 2024. So the dates listed there are May 1st, 2017 through April 30th, 2024. If you're familiar with our previous SSR, um, the report was published in 2019, but the reporting period ended in 2017. So there was kind of a two year gap between the end of the data that we looked at in that report and when the report was actually published. So in this report, we're looking to cover that two year gap so that we're not missing any important information. And then on the screen here, I just wanted to show just generally um, this, this diagram on the left is, is how scientists and how non-scientists communicate and receive information. And so scientists typically, um, those 300 page reports was because usually we wanna provide relevant background, our methodology, and then results. But for that audience, we wanna again, tailor this report to be bottom line upfront and results oriented. And I think Laura probably alluded this, to this a little bit earlier. Um, provide the so what of the information that we're presenting and then relevant background and additional resources will be provided in an appendix, um, including a table on where you can find multiple reports, the deliverables that are submitted by our principal investigators so that if you really wanna dig into the science, you know where to find it. And so some key questions that we wanna answer in this report informed by those programmatic regulations are, are on the screen here and I won't read through them all. But essentially, we want to address whether the goals and purposes of the SERP or the plan is being achieved. This includes whether interim goals and interim targets are being achieved or likely to be achieved, whether corrective actions should be considered based on regional ecological needs, and whether corrective actions need to be considered on that system-wide level, um, again, ecological and social needs. I've been talking a lot about interim goals and interim targets, but for those of you who may not be as familiar in the recover vernacular, uh, just a recap here. Um, interim goals and interim targets are again in the programmatic regulations. And these are the means in which recover looks to evaluate how 
SERP is doing in the system, um, and as the name suggests, interim, through various time steps between now and when SERP will be fully constructed. And so in term goals, um, when I refer to goals, this is specifically a means to evaluate um, ecosystem restoration success. So this will have ties back to our monitoring and assessment plan and the actual ecological indicator species and habitats we're monitoring. In term targets, um, or targets will be referred um, refer to the other water related needs of the region, so these include things like water supply and flood protection of which recover does have performance measures. And these interim goals and targets are uh, to be developed by recover through the use of appropriate models and tools and best available science and information, so what this means um, i'll get into a little bit of more detail on the next slide is um, using the regional simulation models that I think most of you are familiar with and pairing that data with ecological models to, to predict how the ecosystem is actually gonna perform based on different project futures. And there on the screen is the cover page for our 2020 interim goals and interim targets report, which if you're interested um, is available on the Army Corps website under the recover page. So how were the 2020 interim goals and targets developed? Um, on the right is just a sort of a graphical overview um, that will summarize what I'm about to say. So basically it's a modeling exercise. So for those of you who are familiar with how the CERT project teams use the regional simulation or RSM model to look at different CERT project alternatives and how they will perform in the system hydrologically, we're using a very similar process here, where instead of looking at specific project alternatives, we're looking at different time steps um, into the future and which projects are going to be operational at that time to see what those benefits may be from those projects. And so the 2020 IGIT report was based on a 41 year simulation exercise. We use the hydrologic data from RSM um, basins and RSM GL Glades Lexa. And um, we based our modeling efforts on several different um, scenarios. So there was a 2017 existing condition baseline. There was a 2026 future scenario. And this was based on the July 2018 integrated delivery schedule projects. So these include, for example, the C43 and C44 reservoirs. And then there were two different 2032 scenarios, one of which included the original SEP as was originally authorized, and then SEP, um, the post authorization change report, which included the EA reservoir and the STA. And then all of that hydrologic data was pumped into various ecological models. Um, and we were able to assess basically whether we would start seeing improvements in the ecosystem. And um, I will save the details of that report maybe for another time. Again, the report's fully available to you if you're interested, and I can address any questions related to that afterwards. But I just wanted to give you, give you an idea of what we're thinking about when we talk about interim goals and interim targets or IGIT. So for the system status report, coming back to the report for this year, um, what will be reported in it? So we have various indicator species for which monitoring is taking place. So of course we want to include any of the indicators that recover has an established interim goal and interim term target, and then we also want to include those monitoring components under our monitoring and assessment plan that may not have an interim goal or target, um, but is part of our monitoring and assessment plan and therefore we don't want to miss that data or exclude it from the report. So again, I won't go through this whole table, but for your perusal later, um, you can see the recover modules separated there on the left hand column, and then the various indicators, um, both interim goals and interim targets, and others um, that we will be reporting on here. And there's a lot there, so again, I'll um, let you peruse at another time, but let me know if you have any questions about that afterwards. And the framework for the report is we're going to share um, the status of the system. And so, again, one of the things we want to ensure we do this time, unlike with the 2019 report, the status that we were reporting on was based on 2017. And so we really want to make sure that the data that we're including in this report is as up to date as possible so that you know what the status of the system actually is in 2024. So the reporting period for this report is water year 2018 through 24, as I presented earlier. And we're also going to include a comparison or change to a baseline period. Um, and this baseline period was established for our re reporting purposes, um, May 1st, 2004 through April 30th, 2017. So this is water years 2005 through um, 
that should say, uh, what are your 2017? Um, that's another typo, sorry about that. And basically what, why, the reason why we established that period is because 2004 and 2005 are kind of the years in which the majority of our monitoring started. And then of course we wanna bring it up to 2017 as that was the last um, data that we had reported on. And we wanna to try to see whether or not with some of those projects that are coming online and the change in operations, whether the past five to seven years or so we've seen any change in the system compared to that previous period, which is our reference point for when none of these projects were in the ground yet. And so we're gonna be again reporting on progress towards those interim goals and interim targets. So we're gonna take a look at the condition in the system and compare that to what we expected to see um, based on our modeling exercises. Um, we wanna basically answer are we headed in the right direction, right? So we, we not, may not be able to compare apples and oranges, real life data to modeling data, but again, the importance there is are we headed in the right direction? And I'm hoping we'll be able to give some, uh, some good uh, information for the project teams and to our leadership um, about that. And there's been lots of coordination with the principal investigators on how we were gonna do this. This has already started um, several months ago and is continuing now. Um, so finally, um, for methodology, again, these are some of the projects that we're tracking that are expected to be operational within the reporting period. So we have the CERT projects listed, and then we also have non-CERT projects. So this can include um, LOSUM, the new lake schedule, the combined operational plan and modified water deliveries to Everglades National Park, Tamiami Trail Next Steps, and Kissimmee River Restoration. And on the bottom of the slide, that's just, again, an overview of what we're gonna be reporting on. Description of status of the system, a comparison to that pre-SERP, quote unquote, baseline, and then answering key questions that I mentioned earlier as part of the pro-regs. And we wanted this report to look a little bit different. So I talked about this a little bit and how we wanna communicate the bottom line up front. And so rather than preparing this really long technical document, something that we're looking to do in the spirit of our uh, report card that we had done in 2019 was to create more graphical, heavy, um, short summaries um, at different levels within the, the, the system-wide view. So we've got a, 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 a landscape scale sort of system-wide assessment and then we'll have regional assessments as well as individual assessments for each of the indicator species that were in that table um, earlier. And we're again working with our PIs to try to get this information uh, narrowed down as much as we can, the, 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 the key findings and the information that you need to know. Um, and then we're also working with a graphic designer and a tech editor to make these uh, documents as nice looking and as concise as possible. And of course, um, this was alluded to earlier by Laura Brandt, so thanks for uh, your comments earlier. We're tracking these parallel reporting efforts. Um, and so there are several already, including the, the task force reporting and the, the COP biannual report team that we've coordinated with to figure out how we can reduce effort and redundancy in our reporting. And so um, what that will look like in fruition is yet to be seen, but I'm very confident that with the coordination we've done thus far that we're gonna set up a good, a good method for future reporting um, in time, potentially with every other task force report moving forward for recover. Um, and again, the goal to minimize effort, maximize overall com communication and sharing information between reports, leveraging information um, across them as well. And then just an overall schedule. So in July, the SSR data and sections from our PIs and uh, our team leads will be due. In August, September timeframe roughly, we'll be compiling the document. September, October of this year, we'll have um, a couple of internal and public reviews with the intent of publishing um, in December of this calendar year, 2024, the final document. And I've probably had um, enough of your time taken up uh, right before 12, perfect. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on behalf of Recover. And as Lauren said before, I'm just coming back from vacation myself. So if there's anything I can't answer for you today, I'm happy to come, you know, follow up with you after online. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Phyllis. And thanks for willing to jump in before lunch. Um, I want to, again, extend my kudos um, being able to take your science and provide it to the appropriate audience in the appropriate form and fashion in which it can be digested and understood and, and acted upon is huge. 
So reassessing what this audience is, you know, where we're going with it and how to do it, that the two the, is, is, shows it, you know, just how scientists think and then how the policymakers think and being able to put this into a form highly graphical, you know, with some description of what is happening there. But it's just the viewer can look at it, they can see it, it's easy to understand, it helps you move forward with, with what you need to do with the questions that you still have lingering and, and what do policymakers need to do with the information you've provided. So kudos to the team for really taking that approach, um, being able to show interim success when you haven't put everything into the ground is huge as well. I worked on Kissimmee River for 20 years and there was a time where we had hit a, a are we gonna move forward or not? But we had been collecting monitoring data and we were showing positive response with that interim hydrology saying, if we complete it, we can be successful. So that ability to have performance measures that are, are quantifiable, that can go back and, and be tied to what the changes are the project is trying to deliver and being able to report that in a way that's easily understandable, it just helps. We've talked momentum, momentum, momentum. Science can help that momentum if we can communicate it effectively. So kudos. Yeah, Rebecca. Um, Rebecca Elliott, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and also um, Recover Leadership Group and a Recover Task Team member for various things. And one of the things is the 2024 report, but also I'm often a lead for the interim targets. And it's really exciting for me to have the interim targets included because these other water related needs are often not seen, you know, in the ecosystem scheme of things. And they are to take place in balance with the ecosystem restoration, um, but their reporting and their ability to be recognized with performance measures um, has been limited. So I think it's really great that they're going to be in the 2024 system status report. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And I'll just mention to the to the group that Rebecca has been part of that system status report task team, and we're still brainstorming on how we might report on interim targets, what that approach may look like. So if there's anyone within your agencies, I'll make this call now. Also, we are looking for folks with expertise in water supply, flood protection. Um, please reach out to me. My email is on the screen. Um, we'd love to get you included in that team and others so that as we're updating our water supply and flood protection performance measures, and as we're looking ahead to how to a, a report on interim targets in the SSR, um, we'd love your input. It's it's definitely needed. Um, we're, we're lacking some of that expertise currently. And um, the more expertise, the better. So thanks. Chad, did you have a question? No, I was just going to comment on going back to the, the, the programmatic regulations. I think it's a great idea kind of get back, fact check, are we scope creeping or not? And obviously you're not and boiling it down to put it in when you simplify things, it can be a slippery slope. Uh, you make sure you get the, the message correct. Um, and I, I know that you're the right folks on the team to do that. So I was just going to say, I, I think it's a great idea to go back to what Congress initially intended um, before they started signing the checks. So to give them that feedback. Because, uh, But I also, I'm kind of from a, looking at things from the construction because we've just heard that there's so much construction going on that we're actually almost competing with ourselves agency wise. And I know just being in the community, seeing and knowing, having friends in the construction industry, that there is so much work that we're in the system here that it's a lot to keep up with. Yeah. And that a lot of this stuff, it takes time for growing on a regulatory side. It take, we usually provide about five years before, you know, we want to see plants reestablished and things like that. So that's just reestablishing. That's not, getting active and working. So I'm just kind of curious a little bit about the time delay and kind of setting expectations as mm -hmm. Lawrence and uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier when uh, the course presentation was going on of how you're going to kind of caveat, if you will, that these projects are, are just getting going. And, and this is one year. We had a high rain year or a drought year and things like that, those anomalies that will occur. <laughs> How are you going to kind of deal with that and kind of set the expectations for people that don't live here that, to understand it? Yeah, it, it takes time and it's not going to be like you build it in the next year, you're going to see huge benefits. 
Yeah, that's something that the task teams talked about a lot. <laughs> um, and it's something we addressed directly when we started our coordination with our principal investigators who were doing the monitoring in the system. Um, I, the, the, the lag time that you discuss, um, we, ex we expect those to be different depending on the indicator that we're reporting on. There are some things that can um, turn around really quickly and then others that may take years before we see a response from that project. And so we're going to caveat as best as we can up front in that report that um, and what we're expecting to see is that we may not be able to report on much progress from the projects because they just have not been in the ground long enough. Um, and so this is kind of um, almost a, an experiment for recover right now, because this is, again, the first time we're able to report on project performance. But as you said, it hasn't been in the ground long enough yet. And so even if we're unable to make um, concrete assessments of yes, this project is having X, Y percent benefit to this system, this estuary, this uh, water conservation area, what have you, um, we, we are trying to set us up for the next report you know, in 2028 or whatever, you know, whatever year that'll be. Um, because even once we get to that year, we will have things that have been in the ground for several years. There will be other projects that are coming online in the meantime. Um, so that's going to be a challenge that we've been trying to address explicitly and that we're um, challenging our PIs to think about when we meet with them one on one to talk about um, and, and communicate the expectations there. Right. Um, so it's a challenge for sure. Um, but we're setting ourselves up, hopefully, for that next reporting period where things will have been around for a few years and hopefully the system will respond in kind. Thanks, Chad. Are there any other questions? Oh, Jennifer. Thanks for the presentation, Phyllis. It was really, really good. Like, I'm going to take these slides and share them with people who don't understand what the different reporting are, because I think it was really clear and um, easy to understand how Recover is approaching this, how, you know, what the reporting requirements are, and why it's important. Um, one of the things that I hear some skepticism with, and so I'm curious how Recover is approaching it, is the period of simulation or the period of record that's being used, right? It ends in 2005 and includes, I think, 41 years of, of um, period of record. One of the things that I hear sometimes is, um, how is that representative of what we're going to see in the future because of climate change and changed patterns of rainfall and sea level rise. And yeah. so how are you guys addressing that in the report and what can we anticipate in, in order to be able to explain that? Sure. Um, there's a lot to that, to that, to that question. Um, so I'll just try to touch on a couple of the key points. Um, so the period of simulation, so the, the one that I mentioned, the 41 years from the 2020 IGIT report, I think that period ex extension is actually more than it's like 52 years now. I just wanted to just mention that to folks. Um, the period of record extension took place almost simultaneously with the publication of that report. Um, but yes, to your point, um, this is something that recovers um, identified as a, a need in general. When we're evaluating future project performance through you know, our, our planning process for CERT projects, um, this is something that recover, um, this is separate from the system status report, but I'll come back around to it. Um, Something Recover is trying to do as part of our Recover um, interactions with the CERT projects is to identify some of those key uncertainties in the system um, that maybe the models aren't able to show us and climate change, which would include increasing precipitation in, in the system, um, more water potentially in the future, and then things like um, increased incidence and magnitude of tropical storm events is, is going to be huge and that period of record can't capture those future impacts. Um, and so I think there's been some headway with, for example, the BBC project, which is specifically incorporating um, some um, sea level rise work into that. There's a resiliency performance measure. Um, the, the second periodic SERP update is also including um, a future with SERP that includes some sea level rise scenarios. And so the SERP is, as a whole, I would say, is starting to move in the right direction of how to incorporate that stuff in. How that relates back to the system status report, um, what we have again is just the 2020 IGIT that we'll be able to compare back to. So again, that does include that, that, that historical reference, that doesn't include future reference, but in this system status report, we're talking about current status 
and whether interim goals and interim targets are likely to be achieved. Um, I think in this report, some of our maybe statements about how things like climate change and sea level rise will have an impact may be more you know, qualitative in nature. We may say, um, you know, we're headed in the right direction, but this is a concern or uncertainty, or we're not headed in the right direction, and this is an area where we need to maybe heighten our priority for something. Um, and the comparison that we'll be making is based on um, a 2026 sort of time chunk, but we're in 2024, so we're not quite to that first future scenario that we had modeled in that 2020 report. Um, so again, we're for now just trying our best to figure out how to report on progress, that it's likely to be, are we headed in the right direction or not? Um, and of course, in all of our documents, I think there's been an emphasis on communicating that need to develop additional modeling tools, whether that's part of the CERT planning process or as part of the ecological models that we plug that hydrologic data into. Um, so. I could probably speak ad nauseum about what the system needs, but um, that goes beyond this report, but is a thing that we're keeping an eye on system-wide. And Laura, you had some comments. Yeah, Laura Brandt, and I'm putting my Recover Executive Committee hat on here. And Chad and, and Jennifer, you guys raised the exact conversations that we're starting to have within Recover. And in order to have those conversations, we need the people with the dedicated time that can sit down and think through what is it going to take to have us be able to answer those questions. And at the moment, we don't really have that. And you know, hearing Rebecca talk about the, the interim targets, we don't have the people who can dedicate their time to helping us figure out how we get to that answer. And we heard at the task force that there's record dollars, record resources going into construction where are the record resources that are going into the science and the thinking about what we're doing? So it's not just paying for the monitoring that we absolutely need that everybody can see on a, on a line, but we need to have the people who can sit down and think about these things. I mean, Eric and you guys working on the, the task force for the coral reefs, that, that takes your time, which means you're not doing something else. And so I'd really think about who within your organizations can help us work through those questions. Mm -hmm. And so just thinking about how Chad framed it, do you have expertise in your organization that could come to recover and help us think through these things so that by 2028, when we're doing this again, we're in a much better position? Yeah, um, and Rebecca, before I, I just wanted to also add um, an instance in which we've maybe started doing that a little bit was um, USGS and University of Florida came to recover last year to ask us about what our needs are in terms of modeling future climate change and sea level rise impacts to the system. And so I think at a later recover monthly meeting later this year, we're going to get an update from that project team. Um, they interviewed a bunch of recover team members to ask what their needs are, and um, they also brought a social scientist into this. So a different way of thinking about things than maybe I'm used to or we're used to thinking. So um, th this is actively occurring and I, I need to just echo what Laura was saying about having adequate folks to um, to help us with this and, and everything that Recover works on. Um, we've got a huge scope, um, a huge mission and with SERP projects starting to come online, the demand for our expertise is gonna increase. So, you know, I've talked with our, our agency leadership about what we need at the district, and I know the other Recover Leadership Group members have started to do so within their agencies. So, um, just wanted to echo the, the importance of that also. Sorry, Rebecca. That's okay, Rebecca Elliott. And I don't know if this example actually will clarify some of the difficulties, but for something like water supply in the coastal zone that we're working on for performance measures, what we're struggling with is, okay, we have a performance measure that can work for kind of the existing condition, the current conditions, but how do we address the future conditions of the performance measure that doesn't include the future conditions at this time that will be different than what we have? So that hopefully will clarify like some of the challenges that we're having and some of the things that we really need good people with subject matter expertise to, you know, hopefully be able to come to the table with us and sit down and really work this out. So we really have good performance measures in the future that account for the future changes. Thanks, Rebecca. Nick, I believe you'd like to speak. 
Yeah, just a quick comment. You're all teeing up already great topics for the last discussion on science, <laughs> yep. because that's exactly what we're talking about here. Are there any additional questions in the room? And I don't believe there are any. Uh, oh, Rebecca. Or Stephanie. <laughs> No, the, Rebecca could comment. Um, I just want to say that um, I appreciate you bringing that project up, Phyllis, the USGS and uh, University of Florida mm -hmm. project led by Laura DeCunto at the USGS. Um, but I, I want to note that, that that project will not answer the set of questions that were just coming up. It sure. has a different focus. It's about visualization and how do we best understand um, sea level rise and what limits us. We can get into that another time. Um, yeah but I'm not gonna let this topic go that is coming up um, because I think it's really important and I hope that we can talk about it during the science discussion this afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Well, I think we have completed that one and uh, it might be time for lunch, James. Thanks. I think you're right. So let's break for lunch. We'll all will readjourn at 1.15 and have our science discussion and anybody online and in the room for public comments we'll take the in the room public comments first and our attendees online that are here for public comments um, we will be earlier than two o'clock somewhere in the range of 1 30 starting with that perhaps thank you adjourn for lunch
Oh, hello. Uh, uh, no, I'm just going to. Hello, testing. As it looked like it worked, so. There we go. Mike's live, folks. We're on air. Let's all gather around to our seats and we'll get started with our science discussion. I hate to break up the excellent, robust conversation that's going on. We'll bring it to the table for the next section for sure. Well, I hope everybody had a really good lunch. Um, so we're going to have an open discussion right now on future science topics. And I think from my point of view, being a scientist, I think science is at the crux of ecosystem restoration. Um, I want to thank Adam and the OER, OERI team, uh, the working group chairs for supporting my and Angie's uh, request to put recover as a standing agenda item. So that's something that's happened in, in the past two years. And I think it has been so crucial in bringing science back into the discussions that we are. This forum is, is very important. I mean, everybody that's doing work in South Florida, you know, pretty much the main players have a, a member here, whether you're a working group or your science group. And, and having this forum to discuss our science, to make you aware of the needs of science, to make you aware of what is needed going into the future, how it interacts with everything that we're doing is so critical in our success in restoring South Florida ecosystems. So I just, I wanted to, to thank that. I wanted to say that, you know, it really has provided the opportunity for recover in science to get up in front of the task force. Um, that is fantastic. Uh, it has provided the opportunity for scientists to practice communicating science to non-scientists. We've talked about that already today. That's critical in being able to take your complex science and, and, and package it in a way that's understandable and that's actionable. So that's been fantastic. Um, I think it has been great in providing our science the opportunity to say we have unmet needs. We have unmet needs in staffing. We have unmet needs in funding. And from being in front of the task force in several meetings in the past, the state has stepped up this year and has provided $2.5 million to be executed through the district for recover. That's huge. You know, compared to where we have been, that, that is, I mean, these steps that we are taking, they aren't always as fast as everybody wants, but we are making great strides and we are carrying momentum forward in science, its significance, its importance, and its role in South Florida ecosystem restoration. So I, I, I thank you for that. And we know that science is needed and sound science is needed in every step of these large restoration projects. Planning, design, modeling, construction, impact, success monitoring. So the needs are, are, are big. Um, <clears throat> I think what we wanted to do as the chairs here, we wanted to provide an opportunity now again on the agenda to devote time to this forum where we have policymakers and scientists together to, to bring to bear what, what are needs from science? What do we wanna hear about? Uh, what are projects that might need a little push? What are projects that we need a policy side decision on? Um, maybe it's celebrating a positive response because each of us leaves here today and touches so many different people. And if we can have a good nugget you know, that we got out of this meeting on a science need, a science response, something that's going great. That is going to just, you know, it, it spreads out from this group. So now is the hard part, which is trying to, in a large group, <laughs> decide, you know, what do we want to talk about? How do we want to talk about it? How do we want to prioritize items that will come before this group that we need to discuss? And what do we want to get out of it? What is a product we want? It might not be a product, it might be a product, but just having this item on the agenda, I think is really important in that next step of, of making sure that our science needs are met. So I'm going to go around first through the chairs and then I think it's just be open discussion. Bring your ideas 
fortunately, we're going to be having all of this captured on the on uh, the screens in front of us, and we'll have this to to talk about in the future. We might need another discussion on this. We might need to do some work uh, through email after this. But I think getting to a point where we're all on the same page on, on how we would like to move forward with this and then start bringing this regularly to the group will be a, a really big help. So I, I absolutely. Uh, so in addition to what Lawrence was just saying, thinking about those topics that might need to be brought forth to this group and presented to this group, but also what topics might we need to have a focus meeting on uh, just the science coordination group? What might you want to dive into much more deeply so that then we can come back to this larger group and present it as an overview? Um, so thinking about it in both those ways as something to deep dive and then something to report on. I know we're going to go to you and then. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask Nick to go ahead and kick it off for us for the working group. We had a little discussion at lunch. Yeah. I have a small laundry list of things that have come up during our meeting and so forth, but I'd like to see them. I'd like to see what comes up around the room as well. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, as a prelude to what I was going to suggest as a topic, uh, it might be good for us to, you know, do the brainstorming list like we're doing and then like we did in some other instances later where we tried to let everybody give five stars, four stars, you know, sort of come up with a general priority list based on people's input. That necessarily doesn't have to happen today, but that might be the next step once we come up with a big list. I know Alan's good at this kind of stuff, right, of, of helping us coalesce our thoughts. Well, mine is one that you've heard before, and it stems off what I think we heard earlier before lunch uh, with climate change and the ability to uh, use past information to help predict the future and that's going to be more difficult as we discussed because of the changes in climate and you know in patterns that we've not necessarily seen before one that's dear to me and i think it should be important for restoration purposes is is not taking anything away from sea level rise importance because that certainly has a big impact but one that i've been pushing on for a long time is future long-term changes in precipitation and uh, that's a tough one. Uh, be, and I remember when we first brought this up is actually when we did a series of papers in environmental management in 2015, I think. I forget which year it was, it's scary. Uh, anyway, I can't think what year. Anyway, it was a series of papers. We took a climate change scenario, ran it through the South Florida water management model to look at the impacts on you know rainfall and canal flow and all kinds of things. and. One of the things scared us to death was that, um, you know, under one scenario with a warmer climate and 10% less rainfall, we had some really scary things happening from the modeling world, including Lake Okeechobee being at five feet for three or four years, which would be, forget the environment at that point, <laughs> there's bigger problems we have to worry about. That wasn't a prediction, but it made us think about the importance of our water budget to restoration, and that's a, uh, it's a really important one. Back then, some of the early evidence was that it's possible that this part of South Florida would actually get drier. Now I understand that maybe some of the modeling is showing it's wetter, particularly during the wet sea, uh, dry season. We might have wetter dry seasons. What I would like from a science perspective is to hear an update, a summary of where we are on the modeling and analyses related to long-term precipitation patterns, because that is so central to everything we do in restoration planning is knowing how much water we'll have to put in new places or wherever we want to put, put it based on our restoration alternatives, knowing what, having a better handle on what that future pattern would look like would be really helpful. I know there's a lot happened in the last five or 10 years on modeling and then I'd like to hear, you know, as a topic, have an update and a discussion about that. That's mine, start with. Now, I'm just looking for anybody that has a topic or a suggestion or an idea on how or what we should talk about. Stephanie. I wasn't turned your way. Um, I'm like, pick me, pick me. Um, I've just been uh, thinking a bit as, 
I'm hearing the conversation today too. It's brought up a number of things that uh, you know I've been kind of thinking over the years, and so um, the first of those is you know we talk about interim goals and interim targets, and you know where we are in restoration toward restoration progress. But I think there's that uh, kind of looking at a finer scale and thinking about transitions. And so I think that transitions and what do we expect? I think that's something that we haven't been really thinking about. And so there's something, um, you know, for example, now we're doing some uh, vegetation succession. So what do we expect year one, year two, year three? So rather than thinking about, you know, 50 years or the halfway point, are we, you know, I hear all these questions this morning about the reporting, you know, are we headed in the right direction? What do we expect for 50%, you know, of the money? <clears throat> what um, kind of helping us to set our expectations for how we expect the system to respond ecologically and really understanding more about what 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 are what are the steps to get to where we think we're going and you know for example to answer the question is you know is it unreasonable that 10 years later we have we haven't seen response x that we're looking for so really get help, helping us to uh, understand what we can realistically expect for for these changes um so that's one um chris is going to regret letting me go first uh, so the second one is about um, what Nick was just bringing up, which is about climate change. And so, you know, we talk about when when we have we we talked about the uh, where's Phyllis talking about the period of record um, for the the RSM GL being extended, and now we have something up to 2016. And it's no, this is, this is, it's no small effort to have got there. I want to be very clear that I recognize that this is, you know, the, these modelers at the district do just have a tremendous workload and do so much. I do not mean to discount that, but I'll say that it's, it's still only 2016 and we know that we don't expect conditions to look like they were at that time. And so I think that's, you know, we don't expect, Nick talked about evaporation, transpiration changing in one of these um, scenarios that we did. We, we expect that to be different in the future. And so it's, I think it might put us in a tough situation if we're just thinking about the past. And so really thinking about what do we expect a hydrologic future to look like? And that's critical and that's being tried in different ways for BBC or and maybe that's the first of these to come along and there's, you know, there's going to be more that, you know, there were some rough patches and trying some workarounds to try to get something that at least uh, incorporated sea level rise. It was rough. Um, I'm sure the modelers learned a lot. Um, but how do we do that going forward? How do how can you know we we run all these ecological models and say, oh, okay, in you know halfway through restoration we expect this, or under this new plan we expect these other things. Well, do we though? Um, you know, I, I think we. It's not really the future that I I think any of us would say that we're actually expecting to happen. You know, is it better than having nothing? Probably, right? I mean, I, I would think so. Um, but I think it's really something that we. Um, need to focus on. Um, I mean, there's billions of dollars we're talking about going into restoration and we're planning not, I mean, just with, uh, I feel like every way I wanna say this sounds harsh and I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but we, you know, as a community are doing this with blinders on, right? That we're not thinking about what the, what we know about what future conditions might look like. Um, the next thing I would say is um, thinking about uh, response, ecological responses to, to those changing conditions. And so, for example, if we know that, you know, we can talk to Everglades National Park and they're going to tell us that, you know, the southern part of the system is being affected by sea level rise and salinity. And so what happens when those habitats are transitioning and their, you know, salinity is now, you know, these, these plants are in saline conditions for X number of weeks or months or whatever of the year. What are we, ex you know, what, what's the tolerance of salinity to plants, which translates to habitat, which translates to wildlife? And so what do we expect those responses to be like? Um, and I think there's, there's a, a research and monitoring going on at the park and at the universities like FIU. And so let's 
try to take that, can, you know, can we synthesize that? Can we extra extrapolate? I don't claim to know the details. You asked for my opinion, and so I'm <laughs> giving it. Um, and so I think that's something that we could look at. Um, another thing I think we could look at is uh, levels of, of certainty. So as we're thinking about climate change and sea level rise and what we anticipate in the future, I think it could help maybe, you know, every decision maker is going to have their own level of risk tolerance, but but thinking about what are the levels of certainty of these outcomes. And then we make a decision, you know, from those that point of view. So understanding what is the level of certainty or the way that modelers talk about it, the uncertainty, what's the uncertainty in our predictions, right? But let's flip that to our level of certainty is something Laura Brandt has said for a really long time. Um, so what you know, what are our levels of certainty? We can propagate that through our modeling. We can understand that through our monitoring. What certainty do we have in, in these outcomes? Again, setting some more realistic expectations about what we expect to see. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, uh, this is not my area of expertise, but I feel like I hear so many things about um, technology, right? AI and drones and, web crawlers and searching for data and images of uh, tipping points of ecosystems. And I don't know if we have that kind of expertise around. I think we do, at least at the University of Florida, there's some big like drones and AI and supercomputers and that kind of thing. Uh, I should pause and say, look at Nick and say, do we have that in the USGS? Probably. Um, that there could be something really interesting to explore there if we're thinking about monitoring maybe they're more effective or efficient or you know broad scale or look at things in a different way there could be something that um, is sort of low cost compared to i don't mean at the expense of field work or i'm saying that the wrong way but i don't mean to replace field work right i mean understanding what's happening on the ground but to expand that effort possibly at a lower cost. I don't know enough about it to say whether that's true, but I think that there could be something with some really um, bright minds. I mean, I see so many things and I'm sure you see it in your headlines all the time too, what um, scientists are, are coming up with and what we can do. So there could be something interesting there to explore. And thanks Alan for <laughs> trying to capture all that. Thank you. That was great, <clears throat> Chris. Well, Stephanie just said everything, so <laughs> I don't know what I can say. I'll just put a finer point on some things, I guess. I think with regard to the levels of, of certainty, um, to me, it, part of that's not just risk tolerance, but what do we know as scientists that we're not currently doing a good enough job in the Everglades? And I put, Nick pointed out, like, rainfall. I think that's one of the things we don't know that much about, but, like, we know sea level rise is happening. And it's going to keep happening and it's going to have massive impacts on Everglades restoration. And I don't think we're doing as good as we should be at incorporating that into projects and evaluations. And I think um, <clears throat> the other thing that Stephanie brought up that I think is really important is the, um, the kind of transitions she put it, but like the predictions of where things should be. Because right now we're putting out a lot of reports that say everything still is really bad. And I think that that can get interpreted that way, part because we're using existing condition baselines, future without projects, and like, Nobody expects us to be there now. And I think we need to put our heads together and think about where we should be and where we should be five years from now and kind of come to a consensus on that type of thing. So we're evaluating against those instead of against some kind of panacea that we may never get to, let alone get to in five years. Thank you, Chris. Eric. Just going to hop in on one of those along the way. There's a, there's an issue we're dealing with right now that's uh, that's connected to we're seeing changes on the landscape related to the the sea level rise in particular, and we'll likely start to see changes about water availability as well. Be that you know more water or less water over time, hard to say. But what we're doing in our projects is we're still defining these geographic locations and putting a circle around it on the chart and saying here's our zone we want to set to a particular set of conditions over some time years and set a performance metric and i feel like we need to be having a discussion about what the framework of how we do performance metrics and how we deal with uh, a moving future so I, I could use the easy one being in bbc we were dealing with a mesohaline habitat along the shoreline and if you look at recover we have these 250 and 500 meter contours that we're looking at for the dry and wet season metal mesohaline habitat targets um, 
And that shoreline's moving on us. How do we how do we set ourselves up to deal with that moving zone and, and interpretation of it? And I feel like that has some legal framework that's probably associated with it that needs to be considered as well in the way we we establish this project. And it's got importance in terms of how we report out. Um, I got four or five other ones, but I think I'll, I'll stop with just that one up front for now and, and hear from others. Thanks, Eric. Chad. Uh, Chad Kennedy, DEP. I guess the, the things I think about, obviously, from the department's perspective, is that we're building a lot of projects. So we have each one of these projects has components. Uh, aquifer storage and recovery wells is a big one on my mind. The Corps put out a, a documentation and they have a little different view of things than the state does. Topics like that to talk about each feature that we're constructing. Reservoirs. I've read top uh, studies out west where they deal with a lot of evaporation. We also have evaporation and some of the consequences of that. And so I, it seems like to me to talk about some of the features that we're already building, what we're looking at long term, lessons learned from other projects and other regions that are similar. Uh, that, that that would add value to me to talk to things like that. And uh, another one that's a little outside of our normal discussions are we're building a very complex system. And we're going to rely on technology to make sure that we operate this thing to the best, ability, best of our ability. And there's new scientific probes and a lot of things that can be automated. So you're not sending people out in helicopters to grab what things that can be done with technology. And frankly, it's hard to keep up. And I don't know that anybody at this table is, we've kind of been doing it for a long time, but I don't know that we're up to speed on the latest and greatest on what kind of probes are even available out there and that type of thing. Not to mention the whole operations of the system to maximize uh, benefits to the resource. Um, that type of technology to get real time data up here to the control room. Because once the projects are built, the Corps hands the keys to the water management district. Those are the kind of things that are on my mind as far as the science is actually the components we're building, how we're going to use them, and just looking at lessons learned from other regions. That's Thank you, Chad. I'd just like to, from a facilitation standpoint, I'd like to remind our science coordination group and working group members online that you're participating in this topic as well. Just raise your hand and we'll call you up. Go ahead, Gil. So Gil McRae, FWC. Um, just want to reiterate Nick's point on precipitation patterns. If you just look at the last couple of weeks, you have to be thinking, what time of year is it and what's what's supposed to be happening versus what is happening um, and if our if our fundamental seasonality changes, which seems at, at least possible, if not likely. Um, then really a whole lot of things need to be recalibrated so figuring out what we can put into predicting precipitation patterns is as detailed as we possibly can, I think is a good investment. But stepping back to some of the other comments, when we, when we talk about ecological responses, there's, there's massive retooling of a very large landscape that we're trying to do. Um, we, we can identify the best case scenario for ecological response. And I think sometimes that's what we tend to do uh, because it's a tough thing to predict. But there's a range of ecological responses that are likely to happen. Um, some of them good, some of them not so good, and a lot of them not timely enough for what people would like to see. So, um, for example, if, if we get the uh, freshwater inflow right and we get salinity regimes squared away on the east coast that doesn't mean oysters are going to come back quickly or maybe at all because there are other factors to consider same thing for seagrass beds in florida bay so just thinking about how we define ecological responses and investing in some some work that talks about potential ranges of ecological responses and more importantly reporting out to the public about what we're seeing and what it might mean relative to success short versus long term, I think is, uh, is worth investing some time and energy. Jennifer, I don't want to put you on the spot. 
but I'm going to put you on the spot. As we've heard a lot from the scientists, what, and I open this to all the policy side in the house here, what are your needs from this group? Science, what do you need discussed? What do you have to have, need a better, you know, finger on that pulse of? So I'm going to get a, the answer to that question in a roundabout way because I've been noodling as um, people were talking. And so Nick, pay attention because I can't remember the specifics, but I know you'll know. So at GEAR, this past conference, there was a scientist who gave a talk about trajectories. And I don't remember her name or specifically what the talk was about, but what I remember is she showed a diagram of the trajectory of the plan of whatever the topic was she was talking about and how things change from the time that you first initiate a plan and that you need to look at outcomes not only in relation to your plan but in relationship to how reality has changed since the time that your plan was developed. And that isn't exactly what she said, but that's what I think is really relevant to how it applies to Everglades and where we end up having a hard time talking to people about, is SERP working? Is SERP gonna work? Is SERP going to work under climate change? Is SERP going to work under sea level rise? Are you taking all that into account? And nobody asks, is SERP still going to work now that 12 million people live in Florida? Is SERP still going to work now that they've developed more than was developed when we were building the plan in 2000? Is SERP still going to work now that people are using more water, less water, irrigation demands have changed, this, that, right? Like there's all these other things that have changed also. And we talk about those a lot less in the science construct than we talk about maybe the things that we identified as indicators. And so I've been thinking about this ever since I saw that dig talk that we really, I think, need to think through how do we how do we talk about SERP or how do we challenge ourselves to think about SERP in that sort of a construct where we say this is this is what the plan said we were going to achieve now are we really going to achieve that looking at sea level rise climate change changes in precipitation and um, I think in some ways we have to look forward, but I think in some ways we also have to look even farther back than our period of record and take a look at what we know, because some of these are like geologic time series changes that we need to think about. And so I think we have to look at what's happened to the Everglades over time in order to better describe what's going to happen to the Everglades in the future. And then not just changes in terms of, you know, instead of uh, Everglades restoration taking 20 years and $6 billion or 30 years and $13 billion or 50 years and 20 something billion dollars or 30 something billion dollars, I don't know. Um, but in the context of development and changes in the environment and changes in our transportation systems and changes in um, construction technologies, right? All of these things that have changed um, that move those dotted lines on the trajectory graph as well as the solid line, which is our plan. So I went a really long roundabout way to, to talk about that, but I, I think the, those are the things that are 
in my mind as I think about how do we communicate science and the plan and thinking about the what ifs. Um, because I think we have to be able to enumerate those in some kind of a way, even if it's only on scale. I think that's great. Um, because the projects that we work on are so long scale. I mean, the technology that we have when we do the modeling and planning is absolutely different than when we get to the end 30 years later. And we have a, a better way to, you know, look at things and we're, are, are we right, are we wrong? And, and luckily, I think through WERDA, you know, there's adaptive management that can help with that. But I, I think it's really important there are, I think what you just said is, is something that I haven't been thinking about, which is what is outside of the side of science that impacts the ability to reach that, those goals that we have put forward. And then when we're in this group and, and we're talking about science and we're trying to get our science correct and we have sea level rise, which is new, which wasn't contemplated when SERP was written. Um, you know, there, there are aspects in here that we have to make sure that the science that comes out of here is solid enough to go and then potentially change policy to allow for inclusion of these new aspects that we're, we're finding on the forefront that might negatively impact our goal. So that's why I, I really appreciate everybody coming to the table and, and bringing these really good hard questions together that I think we can put a, a sharper point on as a group so that we can make sure that if we're if we see that there is something that's going to impede our ability to get there that we can educate those who have provided the funding for us to do the work that we're doing to try to restore South Florida for them to have an understanding of why we might not reach the endpoint that we thought we would is there another project that gets authorized behind that to, to make up that delta I don't know but, you know, it, I think it's, that's our, our goal. That's what I think we, we need to do in this group. And I'm excited that everybody's at the table bringing great information. Lawrence, Nick would like to have, Nick would like to have a follow-up to that. And we got Joan Browder and a few others on deck here for the online. I'll be real quick then. Yeah. The other way that I would say that is that if forget humans being present on this planet, the Everglades that existed 100 years ago would be different than the Everglades that existed now. There's trajectories that natural systems take, and we need to take that into account as we're moving forward with what we're trying to do. The challenge is all these other forcing factors now that are human related, that, and some of them now, the challenge is some of them are happening way faster than we thought they would, like climate change and precipitation patterns. I mean, I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. And, Things are different now with rainfall and storms in Florida. I mean, unless this is just a little blip, the, you know, when you get Fort Lauderdale Air, Airport underwater, you know, with 20 inches of rain, that doesn't happen all the time. So I, I think that's a really good point. Joan, you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? We can. can you? Okay, good. Uh, well, I wanted to say, uh, following on what Jennifer said, uh, that if you look at the history of the Everglades, the long-term history, it was built on a condition of rising sea level. That's how we got the Everglades. Of course, it was at a certain rate if it had gone too fast. And I guess there were times in history when it did go too fast, there wasn't any creation of, of peat soil or or our marble soil, but, uh, and, and going along with that, in B.B. Sears planning, uh, there's, uh, in the wetlands, they're actually considering that uh, there'll be soil accretion, uh, uh, particularly in the mangrove fringe, uh, and uh, that that will hold back uh, sea level rise from flooding the interior wetlands. And so, we can't we we don't have to think only of the, the um seawater area expanding because there could be other alternatives brought about by the ecology and the hydrology uh, and um 
So I think we ought to consider that and think about those things too. And in fact, those are important things to think about in, in, in science, uh, knowing more about that. And um, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think. I, I had another point. Um, should have written it down, I guess. Um, anyway, that, oh, I know. Uh, uh, Recover's been going, uh, and also uh, BBC have been going through a big thing of um, uns uh, listing uncertainties for the adaptive management, uh, uh, for the uh, yeah, adaptive management uh, process. And I think that, that those uncertainties are a good place to harvest science needs because uh, <laughs> it's science is what uh, helps us uh, deal with those uncertainties. Maybe not all of them, but some of them could be addressed. So uh, I think that, that those uncertainties, particularly as they're getting honed down uh, to uh, the really important ones, uh, ought to be addressed when picking topics for uh, science needs. And that's all I have. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Joan. On the phone, we have Bob Johnson. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I want to add to this is just the uh, loss of uh, water storage, the, the idea of water availability. And I think most of us know if you go back and look at the yellow book and the summary tables of the amount of storage we would have in the system once CERP was complete, whether it's uh, conventional uh, surface water reservoirs or aquifer storage and recovery or in-ground reservoirs or uh, even wastewater reuse, there were millions of acre feet more water that we anticipated being available in SERP than what we have on the IDS today. And you know some of that is because of our changes in understanding of new technologies like ASR, some of it's because of concerns, you know, legitimate concerns about high water conditions in areas like Lake Okeechobee. Uh, some of it's just uh, we haven't gotten to all the projects yet, but uh, there's going to be I, I'm waiting for the second periodic SERP update uh, to understand this better, because that'll be our time to have all the SERP components put into one model run. But I'm waiting to find out what we're going to do about the fact that the amount of water that we anticipated having available is much less than we started with when this project was laid out, you know, kind of how do we get there from here? You know, uh, we're not setting aside water at the beginning or the middle for the projects that are coming at the end, because there'll be some projects at the end that won't have water based on where we're heading. So just something to think about as we go forward. Thank you, Bob. Um, Gina, you have been entering a lot of comments into the chat. Was there anything that you wanted to kind of focus on with the group. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry to put all of this stuff in the chat and then run, um, but that's what I had to do for today. Um, so many of the topics that I had um, sent last week um, have already been discussed here. Um, just to highlight real quickly, it's the CISREP recommended uh, South Florida Science Plan. I sound like a broken record on that one, um, but that would be wonderful to, to kind of dedicate some time tool to. Um, we also have some um, harmful algal bloom tools that are currently in the works uh, with University of Florida and other principal investigators. Um, these are more for water to help inform water management decisions. Not, not sure if those are quite ready for uh, discussion with this group, but they uh, could be um, at a later, um, maybe this year. Um, also, we've already talked about integrating climate change, uh, specifically uh, precipitation, storm frequency, evapotranspiration into our, our modeling tools. Um, also, some uh, adaptive management um, options and strategies for uh, climate adaptation. Um, and then, of course, inter uh, incorporation, incorporation of uh, nature-based features. Um, and then, you know, such things as thin layer placement to deal with our accretion and subsidence issues within uh, some of the uh, SERP footprint. Um, 
And then exploring uh, novel and less cost effective water quality treatment options uh, for water reuse and, and water storage, getting to what Bob was saying about uh, those additional needs in the future. And then Jen Reynolds uh, reminded me of a presentation I often revisit. Um, I believe it was Denise Reed last year at Gear. She gave a, a really good thought provoking um, talk. Um, it wasn't a TED talk, but it was Gear's equivalent of a TED talk on, you know, sometimes you have to actually crack some eggs to make some progress where we may have some long standing policy issues that are impeding in some areas of the system restoration. And maybe it's time to kind of bring those out into the light and, and really talk about um, moving through. Um, so with that, um, I apologize that I have to leave, um, but just wanted to uh, throw those out there for consideration. So thanks so much. Thank you, Gina. Go ahead, Eric. I, I, I'm going to struggle with this one just a little bit, and I think it's because, and that's a kind of an indication of where we're at in terms of our education on it. Um, as, as Jennifer brought up over here, where we were talking about some of the influences, the human element on the system, and Nick had brought up the amount of time of the evolution of Everglades as a whole and what it would look like without the human element in there as well. And yet, as a group, we tend to think of them as an ecological element and a human element rather than a merged environmental system that has both those influences. And if there's anything we've learned from our tribal partners in the last few years is to try to get us to stop thinking in such a compartmentalized way and start thinking a little more merged. So looking at the list of topics and what I wrote down from the topics here, this idea comes up again and again for me that we should be carefully considering those influences together in some way in these other technical discussions. Um, you know, we're not the first peoples on this land. And so we, we have a lot to learn here. I think then uh, that might be just one part of it, that little bit, if we could just try to hold them together and keep that weight of both in the discussion, both those natural influences and those human influences and, you know, the nonlinear way that interacts. Yeah, that's all I say. Didn't struggle with that as much as I thought I would. <laughs> no, you didn't. And uh, I just wanted to, to thank you and how you started that. We don't have to be perfect in what we say in here. Um, say it, bring it to the forefront, and let's discuss it. Um, you know, I'm not the smartest person in this room. I'm not going to worry about how I phrase something. I'm hoping I'm in a place where everybody, you know, knows we're, we're working towards the same goal. So I, I appreciate how you started that. And I think everybody just bring it to the forefront. Um, there, there's no stupid questions <laughs> and, and uh, let's work together. So thank you. Matt Lawrence. No. Nope. Do we just miss hand over here? Roland, will you put your hand up? I'd be more interested in understanding uh, ecological response to natural disasters, like in our case, hurricanes. Um, we, we suffered a lot of uh, natural systems uh, devastation and what does recovery look like or do we need restoration? Uh, you know, I, I suspect ecosystems are pretty resilient, a wound, they can come back, but you know, mortal blows, perhaps it won't come back in kind. You know, is there is it one of those wait and see what, what returns or is it something we can supplement to get it back on its feet again? So I'm not sure how much information is out there on that, but we're gonna be faced with, you know, restoring some of our natural lands. Thank you, that was, that was good. I, oh, we got a few, a few more hands going up. Uh, I think Jennifer was first. Mine is just a quick one. One other thing that I've been thinking about as we um, talk about what should, you know, what science topics should we be thinking about is, um, Stephanie had talked about the, um, now I forget uh, what word, she used, I wrote it down though, hang on one second. The levels of, um, no, I wrote down what I was thinking. Um, I, I forget what she was, she was talking about, but um, I was thinking of levels of sensitivity. So like the level of sensitivity to a certain um, scientific topic as it relates to 
um, our evaluation of its relevance um, to SERP and to decision making, right? So some of the scientific um, things that we're looking at, they are important and measurable, uh, but what's the level of sensitivity as it relates to SERP? So as compared to the level of sensitivity as it relates to sea level change, for example, which we can't control in the SERP projects, right? So there's things that we can control and, and decisions that we can't control. And not that those things that we can't control, some of those may actually be more important to the overall effect on the resource, but it's not sensitive to the decision that we need to make for SERP. And so being able to tease that difference out, I think is something that we're gonna to need to continue to wrestle with. That is a good point. Christopher, yeah. Christopher had a comment. Yeah, one, one of the things that I wondered about that went on by, by Roland's comment, and we're doing a lot of this in the coral world where it's assisted evolution and kind of stress hardening in experimental facilities before putting out in the wild. I don't know if there's, I'm aware of a lot of that research that's climate change related. I'm not sure if there's anything similar for restoration or how it would play in the Everglades, but there might be some space there. I think when we started SERP, that's one of the things that changed. We had this viewpoint of we don't touch natural areas and we don't interfere with them. And now I think we've come to a realization in the sciences that if we want to get them to where we want to get them to, that might not be a method that we can take. Sounds like out of Fred Sklar's group, the active marsh improvement, you know, helping build a slough uh, to when water wasn't going the way it was supposed to go. You know, how can we help it along instead of just hoping that it's going to work properly? Rebecca. Rebecca Elliott, and it's a hydrology question, but it's also a salinity water that's at the coast. And that has to do with groundwater and that there's going to be the rise in groundwater, which will also impact fresh groundwater storage. It will also impact, you know, flood risk as far as groundwater being higher. So fresh groundwater is predicted to be higher, but also, you know, salty groundwater or brackish groundwater is also predicted to be higher. So those interactions with saltwater intrusion, with sea level rise, with groundwater, I think is really important to try to understand. Well, I think we may have exhausted everybody's uh, <laughs> ability to think after lunch today, but oh, go ahead. I still had a few. We, yeah, I wanted to hear what was coming from the room, and the and the room has got such, and the, and the reason why is that list contains such great things and ways to examine and tease out some of these changes and nuances. Mine is more of a list in terms of agenda formation for the next year and upcoming year. And I had on here um, corals with expanded. It's come up several times today. I think some kind of some kind of presentation. I wouldn't dictate what that was, but some kind of presentation, maybe, maybe an update from our team to really um, get a good view of the status of the system on that. That's a very hot topic. Um, tree islands, something that's coming up very consistently across all the different plantings with, I don't know, a couple billion dollars of work going in, in and around the Everglades Wildlife Management areas. Tree islands are a constant conversation. And there's tree islands and there's vegetated, there's engineered vegetative hammocks. And we had a recover workshop, kind of bringing all that together with some nomenclature and then added to all that on how to build them. There are two or three different scientists looking at different metrics to develop performance measures around trails, and that's happening in the recover world. So maybe bringing that together to this group at some level for a broader discussion and, and um, sharing of information. Um, I had down the climate change has been brought up several times, but specifically maybe a report out on the US Geological Survey that was conducted and mentioned earlier um as part of that climate change update and then um, we've also had some conversation in the chat about 
Water Quality, Lake Okeechobee, and Habs that were also out for, out from um, Gina Ralph put some of that in there. So these are some of the things that are a little more laundry list like than it's been talked about, but I didn't want to close the document without picking some of these up. Mm. Thank you, Lawrence. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank everybody to, for coming to the table and, and bringing your knowledge, your expect. Uh, so one more, hold on. Chad, red wine, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to add my list, uh, I want to add my suggestions to this discussion of science needs. Um, I, pro I probably missed about half of the what was going around table, so pardon me if these are redundant, but I'll be concise. Um, for me, one of the most important science needs for SERP is landscape scale plant community monitoring. Um, one of the concerns that I hear from tribal members um, in the Seminole tribe on a consistent basis is their concern that medicinal organisms are harder and harder to find. Um, most of those, most in most cases, they're, we're talking about plants. Um, but what I'm when I put that through my science translator in my head, what I'm concerned is that we're seeing patch level extirpation of organisms. Our patches are becoming slowly less diverse. Um, we've had a historical challenge kind of systematizing a landscape scale uh, vegetation monitoring pr process and um, because it's challenging and it's large scale. Um, but irrespective of those challenges, it's important that we go forward and begin to perceive and understand how the engineered system that uh, the infra engineered infrastructure that drives our system, how it's influencing patch specific um, survivorship of, of plant species. Um, if our landscape is becoming less and less diverse and we're not seeing it, it's going to be to the detriment of, of us and to the detriment of the future generations. Um, the second element, you know, I think we really need to, we need to get the obvious elements of a water budget on the table, which is every time we drain some place or every time we protect a road and we have to take the water table to two feet below ground, we need to calculate how much water storage we need to offset. Um, that needs to occur at every location where we're altering water level or we're delivering a level of flood protection. We need to understand what our water, um, how much storage we're losing. And we need to have a running tally of that. Um, I, for me, I think the highest priority issue for me going forward in my water quality program with the Seminole Tribe is cyanobacteria. Um, the risks that they present to individual tribal members, um, the relationship between the expression of the cyanobacteria and the operations of Lake Okeechobee, the relationship between literal shelf, um, the health of the literal shelf in Lake Okeechobee and the probability of cyanobacteria blooms, the relationship between macronutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, as well as inorganic nitrogen on the probability of cyanobacteria blooms. So all of the things that we can influence which are affecting the likelihood cyanobacteria is gonna be expressed on the landscape, that's one side of it. Unfortunately, because these blooms have become so frequent, we also need to work the other side now, which is how, what kind of bioaccumulation of toxins are we observing as a result of cyanobacteria? What are, the, what are the food chain risks? What are the effects um, um, on recommendations of fish consumption rate for people, uh, for people who live um, by collecting their food from the landscape? Um, that, that category of, of science, it's unfortunately, it's time for us to engage in that category of science. Um, and then last, you know, the, the conduct of management of science needs to be addressed um, for SERP. It's unwise for us to take engineering dominated organi organizations and ask them to develop science programs. Um, the people who manage the science program need to be held accountable, but they need to have the basic skill set that now allows them to actually effectively manage a science process. And uh, I'm concerned that we don't have that at this point. Um, so thank you for your time. And that closes my comments. Thank you, Jed. I just want to extend my thanks to everybody for this topic, really kind of noodling through it, bringing all of your ideas to the forefront. 
uh, we will take these back. We will group them in kind of like chunks and we will, I will send something back out to the group, uh, try to come up with a, a priority order list, uh, people who might have the, the ability to come and speak on this. And, uh, and I'm not closing the door on this yet. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I just, I just appreciate everybody coming to the table and, and bringing your, your information to bear. Oh, Wes Brooks, you are, you have the floor. Thanks, Lauren. Sorry uh, about chiming in late. Um, I think this is a, a really interesting conversation to hear. Um, and, and certainly, you know, there, there are a lot of things that, that we don't understand about the system um, and, and probably won't uh, for, for a very long time. There will always be some level of, uh, of questions facing us. Um, I just wanted to add some thoughts um, to tie this conversation into the conversation that the working group had maybe about a year ago, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Um, and just to sort of just step back and fundamentally um, think about what our roles, you know, as, um, as working groups and science coordination group in, in support of this, this larger effort. Um, and so to me, um, and I don't have the answers to this. I'm just throwing this out there. I, I, I think I think our role really is to think about what are the critical decisions facing the task force and its member agencies this year, five years, ten years from now. Um, and and if we're not setting the table for the task force and the agencies to make decisions that lead us down whatever path we we need to go down. I'm not sure we're doing, you know, our, our jobs as well as we could be. And for the science coordination group, that leads me to what information, right, does the task force and do those agencies need to support whatever decisions they need to come to on those decision points? Um, that then gets us back into prioritizing research decisions. Um, and then we fall back into the constraint of resource limitations, right? And so... In, in, in some ways, I, I just wanted to flip this conversation around on its head and have us also think think about it from the other direction. Um, you know, everything that we do, I mean, this this really is applied science. Everything we're we're doing is to get to some decision that is supposed to be better for the goals that we have in place. And I'm honestly, I'm honestly wondering whether it is worth us and the task force reiterating what those goals are and, and backing up through what information is necessary to support those decisions and, and how we how we go about that. Um, just a, a, a side conversation on, on a lot of these things too, in terms of, um, you know, whether it's climate or, or something else, uh, uncertainty is a really key factor here, right? Um, things that we have really strong certainty or high certainty with, should absolutely go into building, you know, of a plan or designs or things like that. Um, and so sea level rise, right, from a climate perspective would be one of those things that I, I think we have a, a, a pretty good understanding uh, of, of what potential rates of rise are and, and, and the sensitivity associated with those. Um, something like precipitation is a little tougher, right? Um, we already have very high interannual variability um, in the system across different portions of the system. Um, and as I think some of our folks have mentioned, there's a lot of discussion about which direction, um, you know, precipitation actually may trend for the for the region overall, um, let alone subregions. And then add into it, you know, whether we're talking about average precipitation for the year or specific high impact events, right? Like Nick mentioned with, with Fort Lauderdale. Um, and so, you know, that, Precipitation to me, as someone who looks at this information a lot in terms of how we modify the built environment, um, that's one where where I think we we have a lot of uncertainty there, um, and so that doesn't mean that we dismiss it. But I think I, I think it means that we need to focus more on sensitivity analyses that might point to certain factors or things to keep an eye on, but not necessarily incorporating 
you know, something into specific project design today, especially when we're blessed with, you know, Lawrence mentioned our adaptive management capacity, right? Um, and so that just one last thing takes me to rates being really important here, right? Is, is the rate of change that we're expecting from any given factor exceeding our ability to keep up with it or not? Um, and if it's not, I would treat that overall as less important in the grand scheme of what we're trying to do here and start moving a project more quickly to get it done um, than, than necessarily holding back and trying to reformulate to you know a closer approximation of what, what we think will absolutely happen 20 or 50 years from now. Um, these are really tough questions. Um, and so again, taking it back to what are the goals of the task force? What decisions do they need to make? I think is really keeps us on the straight and narrow in terms of, of trying to make our time and our resources effective and useful. Um, even though there are a million questions we might want to answer and understand as, as, as scientists, right? Speaking as a scientist myself, um, I, I can't get enough of understanding how the system works. I've learned so much from so many of you, even as someone who thought they knew a little something about the Everglades before they came into this. So um, anyway, that I will stop ranting and uh, and thank you for the time. And it's incredibly important. Thank you, Wes. And I think that was a perfect illustration of what Phyllis showed earlier of the one triangle facing up, one triangle facing down. You know, how are we coming at this? Uh, of course, the scientists have one view on it, the policy has another view on it, but we need to come to, uh, I really liked what Wes said about what does the task force need? What science do they need in order to help decisions move forward? Because that's who we do report to. Um, we love doing science for the knowledge that science gives us, but we also need to stay, and, and, and that doesn't mean that the discussion in here is bad because it is, it is bringing science to the forefront of where, where do we need to grow, but we need to make sure that it is focused enough to provide exactly what the task force is asking of us. So this was really fantastic discussion and I, I thank you all for it. Thank you. Thank you, well done, Lawrence. Good discussion, everybody, thank you. Well, it's going to take us right into our public comment period for the afternoon. And we have one public commenter in house in, in the room here. So Newton Cook, please join us at the table. We're going to take you first. But while Newton's getting situated, I'm, I'd just like to announce that this is the start of the official public comment period. Any, I'll encourage anybody who's online to go ahead and raise your hand so we can get you in order. And when you speak, Newton, please use the microphone. And those online, please make sure you um, have your microphone activated and speak into the microphone so we can hear you clearly in the room. And I'd like to encourage everyone to keep their remarks to two to three minutes. Sandy, please um, start the public comment period. Newton. Thank you, James. Uh, Newton Cook, United Waterfowlers of Florida. Uh, I've said it before at these meetings, this is my favorite meeting and I go through a few in a year. And these meetings are the best of the best because the people you have here are the best of the best in the whole restoration projects that we have been running. And I've been watching them for 20 years. And it's highly appreciated for the chance to make a few comments. Um, United Waterfowlers has been around for 20 years and we started because the Everglades needed, the restoration was important to the ducks. So that's one reason it got us started. But of course, obviously, uh, we branched out a bit, at least I have from those days. The buzzword was ecological indicators. I heard that. Here's an ecological indicator for you. It wasn't even mentioned today. Not a word. Heart of the Everglades. Everything that we do from Orlando to the Keys, depends on the health of Lake Okeechobee. And today, purposely, intentionally, we're killing Lake Okeechobee. The lake is at 16 feet today, going up. This is the dry season, it's supposed to be going down. 
But we have a management of the lake today under Losom, which is a disaster for Lake Okeechobee and will prove to be a disaster for the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie River. Because if the lake is 16 feet today and we had Fay, remember Fay? It would be a minimum of two feet have to be taken off that lake right now. And that's going to go out to St. Lucie and the Caloosahatchee. Not a word. And this is supposed to be the science coordination group for Everglades restoration. I don't, can only tell you this. I uh, got a few years left, and I would love to see the lake treated properly. For once. For once. We're putting band aids, reservoirs, because we can't move the water south. We can't move the water south for two reasons. Bottom of the lake, 6,000 CFS is all you can drain out of the bottom of the lake south. Irma put 30,000 coming in from the north. Faye put 18,000 coming in from the north. And you tell me you're gonna do something about Lake Okeechobee when you can't get the water out? And then when you do get it out into the WCAs, the tree islands all get drowned and everything backs up for one reason. You know what that reason is? It's a bird called the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow that blocks flow past Tamiami Trail to about 7,000 CFS max. Our mod waters will give us 18,000 CFS possibility under the trail. And until we take 18,000 into the lake, new structure at the bottom of the lake, 18,000 out of the lake, and remove the blockage at the trail, and move 18,000 to Everglades National Park where it's supposed to go, used to go, and then to Florida Bay. We haven't done any restoration. We're just putting Band-Aids on a failed system. Thank you. Thank you, Newton. And thank you for your patience and waiting, and patience and joining us in the room today. We'll move to our online commenters. Ben Olson. Hey, good morning or good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. We have you. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking today regarding WERP. Um, at the CISREP meeting last Wednesday, I pointed out to the scientists that were there that there are tens of thousands of acres of critical panther territory deliberately ignored in the WERP draft report. I also pointed out that just about every single endangered species on the list in the draft report is in the footprint that I'm speaking on. Uh, now, I've read the draft report in its entirety, including all the appendices and annexes. It was quite a bit. And as I stated, the only panther territory acknowledged by the Corps specifically was the 3,700-acre North Feeder STA, which you claim will have panther habitat units used to offset primary habitat destruction. Uh, what was interesting, however, was the Corps' response when questioned by the scientists uh, regarding my concerns about the West Feeder flooding, which is give or take 10 times the size of the primary panther habitat you plan to mitigate. The Corps reiterated you worked in conjunction with Fish and Wildlife as a dismissal of my concerns. When pressed uh, by the scientists for more specifics, again, all that was stated was you worked in conjunction with Fish and Wildlife. I've reread the 562-page Annex A on endangered species and Fish and Wildlife cooperation just to confirm. The only mention of panther habitat units in the entire report is the North Feeder STA. You never once mentioned the roughly 35,000 acres you intend to flood under this plan, let alone the additional acreage I contest will be flooded from incompetence, a lack of modeling when the Kissimmee Billy Strand culvert is even closed, and the insane operation decision being based purely on ITEC, giving unilateral control without monitoring over when and for how long the Kissimmee Billy Strand is shut. For that matter, I didn't really see anything specific on Panthers other than the North Feeder SDA and a vague generalization that the project will be good for Panthers, quote, in the region. At the October 26, 2023 Fish and Wildlife meeting for conservation easements in the region, Fish and Wildlife had zero knowledge of this flooding. 
my family land was priority one land. And all the lands in this footprint were either priority one or two, according to Fish and Wildlife's modeling. While Fish and Wildlife is trying to get me and my neighbors to sell conservation easements to them, we had to inform them that you're intending to flood what they designated as some of the most important wildlife territory. I'm only focusing on the panther here because you're only giving me three minutes. Virtually every endangered species in the draft report is in this footprint you refuse to acknowledge you're creating and expanding a floodplain in. If you won't answer me at this meeting, I'm going to ask these questions for answers tomorrow. Just who specifically did you consult with at Fish and Wildlife and to what detail? Was the only consultation with Fish and Wildlife pertaining to panthers in the North Feeder STA? What data was offered to them? And what was there any concern expressed about panther habitat for additional areas in the footprint? I expect those answers tomorrow. I want specific names from Fish and Wildlife personnel you coordinated with to follow up on. Finally, really quick, I know I might be going a little bit over time, but Superintendent Ramos, I do hope you and the rest of the Everglades Task Force make time to be at the meeting tomorrow in person. We might not be Norway, but the public house after would greatly benefit being able to directly communicate. And the final point, this plan no longer includes water quality. It abdicates that to the state to resolve prior to any construction. There is zero reason to backfill the large Gannon Wingate Milk Canals. Put closable culverts on the West Feeder so Seminole iTech can determine when water goes into the native area without running a risk of flooding any clean panther lands. And backfill the L-28 interceptor south of I-75 so you don't flood Looneyville while also allowing water to spread out into preserve, alleviating Miccosukee uh, lands. This plan cannot go into winter 24 as it is. It must either be outright rejected or significantly altered prior to the chief's report. I think that might be possible, but it's only going to be possible if you work with the people that actually know this land. As of yet, you haven't. Thank you very much. Kelly Ralston. Thank you. Um, Kelly Ralston representing Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Um, first off, I want to commend the core and the water management district on the tremendous project progress that we've made on Everglades restoration. I think the the presentations earlier on current state from, from each of those agencies was just um, mind boggling and, and exciting to see. And I think a lot of that has to do with the agencies working cooperatively together, but also um, the funding certainly helps um, both record funding at the state level and at the federal level have really kind of helped move uh, projects along through planning, design and construction. Um, I wanted to let y'all know that um, BTT supports both of the, the northern um, Lake Okeechobee projects as well as WARP for authorization and WERDA. Um, as the previous uh, commenter mentioned, we know that there are still some issues to work through, particularly with WARP, um, but we are confident that um, with communication and um, some additional work that we can get there and keep those on track for authorization in 2024. We were also encouraged to hear about the Water Management District and URDIC um, working together um, to look at ASR technology. Um, it's an important component of Everglades storage and restoration um, throughout the, the system, but especially around the lake. And we appreciate the extra effort there to make sure that we're doing it safely and responsibly. Um, and then talking about recover, I mentioned this, I think at the last um, science group, working group meeting, um, you know, understanding kind of where we are environmentally in this process is becoming even more important as we move forward with more and more projects under construction and moving towards completion. And so we really do kind of need that assessment of where we are currently, where we were in the past, and kind of to help us inform how we plan um, for future progress as well as needs and adjustments. And I thought the science discussion um, was really informative. A lot of great points were brought up there. Um, but I think one thing that was really helpful um, in securing the record funding for Everglades restoration projects was actually knowing what those financial needs um, projected out are. And so talking about recover kind of as that program becomes more and more essential to direct um, Everglades restoration projects, I think having, having an idea of what funding might be necessary, both from the state and the federal levels, in black and white really helps us as stakeholders be able to advocate um, for the science needs, um, not only for restoration projects, but also monitoring and their evaluation as well. Um, so I encourage you as you kind of talk about those science needs, also trying to associate dollars <coughs> with it. Um, even if they seem pie in the sky, they really do um, make a difference when you go into an office so that you have a concrete ask of what those needs are. Again, thank you so much for the, the time today and, um, and appreciate your hard work. Eileen Bacaba. 
Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. My name is Eileen Bikaba. I am president of a Property Owners Association named Nomi Neighbors in North Miami. Within our area, there are low-lying areas that connect to the C8 Canal. They ex we, that those areas experience extreme flooding that completely bring the quality of life to a halt for our homeowners. There is no drainage on the street in the city of North Miami promised to provide drainage for this, those areas. South Florida water management districts have previously said that there are challenges in absorbing more of Northeast Third Court and surrounding area called Annex Area 3 water into the C8 Canal. How will the Everglades Restoration Project influence the volume of water in the C8 Canal and the city's ability to provide drainage? to the residents in our area. Thank you. <laughs> no other pipes? Good afternoon, Nyla Pipe sound check. Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. I just wanted to start first and foremost by echoing the concerns with WERP. Um, I still do not believe that we are there as far as involving the people most directly affected, let alone the concerns brought up um, regarding the panther and the other endangered species, et cetera. Um, I also continue to stand beside Newton in his uh, comments about Lake Okeechobee and our concerns with Lotsam. That being said, based on today's discussion, I really wanted to applaud you for bringing up the concerns about people the fact of the matter is we have development outpacing mm. restoration in every single corner of this state. And it's really becoming a very big problem. And I think it's something we tend to look at the other way on because development is literally how taxpayer dollars continue to flow in. And, and I just I don't know what the solution to that problem looks like, but I do think it's something we have to face head on. We have to talk about the increased demand on water supply. We have to talk about each development and how much that reduces our wetlands. You know, as we continue to pour those taxpayer dollars into projects uh, north of the lake, like Low Car, uh, in IRL South, we also continue to watch new developments go up every single day. I think that that's really been exacerbated by COVID and the huge influx of people we've had. Um, just at the same time, we're beginning to really ramp up the amount of spending and construction on Everglades restoration. It's a real problem. And I think it's something we need to tackle as hard as we've tackled the studying of things like cyanobacteria. Thank you. Matthew Taylor. Uh, yes, uh, radio check. Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Matt Taylor here, uh, seventh generation Gladesman and Floridian. I'm a property owner within the Big Cypress National Preserve uh, Turner River Unit. I'm also the president of the Isaac Walton League Cypress uh, chapter. Uh, two items I want to comment on today, the first one being WERP. Um, as proposed, <clears throat> I, I think we're getting closer, folks, and I know that everybody's worked hard on it. I, I certainly do appreciate all the hard work on WERP. But I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. Neither do any of the folks that that I socialize with, both professionally and and um, privately. As proposed, the only folks that really benefit from it are the folks north of I-75, with the exception of some of the culverts that you're going to install or plan to install under uh, US-41 and Loop Road. Those are the same culverts that we were promised would be installed over 20 years ago, and well, here we are in 2024, and they haven't been installed yet. So, look. Get your pencil sharpened again and, and let, let's get it tuned up because I wholeheartedly support WERP. I know it's a needed project, but it's not needed in the form it's currently uh, sits in. The second thing that's most disturbing to me, and I'm going to iterate this now, then again later, um, is the wilderness designation within the Big Cypress National Preserve. That is a hill that I will die on and I intend to fight tooth and nail, um, as well as all of those around me who are supporting me and I'm supporting them. We are ready willing, able, and prepared to fight this in court as needed. Big Cypress National Preserve is a preserve and not a park. To compare it to the EMP, 
and to the work that's allegedly being done in the EMP in wilderness designated areas is laughable and nobody buys that. If anything, what history has shown us all around the nation is that areas designated as wilderness simply shut the door and close the blinds on the public's ability to look as to whether or not the property is being managed properly. Currently, in the Big Cypress, you have someone in the Tom Forsyth who has done an outstanding job and who fights tooth and nail to try and control your invasive exotic species such as uh, old world climbing vine, uh, Brazilian pepper, melaleuca. And he does as much as he possibly can with the little bit he gets. Your primary sponsor when it comes to controlling invasive exotics, exotics when it comes to plants are the FWC. The FWC is opposed to wilderness designation, as are the Miccosukee, as are all of the other Gladesmen and stakeholders that I know and talk to regularly. Again, it's a preserve. To designate it wilderness is contrary to the enacting legislation and actionable that created the preserve in the first place. Again, like I said before, I'll say it again, we will die on this hill. Thanks. Betty Osceola. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, Betty Osceola, uh, tribal member of the Mikituki Tribe of uh, Indians of Florida, speaking for myself. Um, thank you, um, Jed, for mentioning those concerns on behalf of tribal members of the Seminole Tribe, which I wholeheartedly agree. We're seeing a lot of the medicinal plants and other items that we use for traditional healing and our ceremonies are disappearing at an alarming rate because of the mismanagement of water and these projects that are being built without fully those individuals not fully understanding how the landscape works. Um, for work, at this point in time, I do not support it. It still has a lot of work to go. Maybe the tribe is saying they support it, but there are a lot of tribal members who have not even heard of work. And, you know, hopefully the Army Corps will have a public meeting for our tribal members because there's a lot of, yeah, you have a, a people re representing Miccosukee in your science group, but they are not Miccosukee tribal members. Our memberships have not been given the opportunity to have any type of presentation on work as public meetings are occurring. Also, too, these programs have failed to also speak and address concerns that are of the descendants of the Seminoles and Miccosukees who call themselves the independent Seminole Nation. They have concerns. They have the right to know how they're going to be impacted. And none of these programs for the different agencies through South Florida Water Management, Army Corps, have failed to address these groups of people. They're entitled to know what's going on. So at this time, you know, they need to be brought up in speed and their concerns need to be addressed. So I don't believe WERP is at a point that needs to be funded, regardless of what a letter might have been penned by Chairman Cypress. He doesn't speak for every Native American in this state. We have the right to express our opinions. Also, too, for the wilderness designation, I have concerns as do other tribal members of how that is going to impact our ability to be who we are and access those areas as we historically did. I do understand, uh, you know, um, Pedro has said that, you know, there will be exceptions made. But unfortunately, you know, people die. Pedro will not always be the superintendent. And, and you know, there's when has the federal government or any government kept their promises to the indigenous people? All treaties and agreements are broken time and time again. So we don't trust what you say. And we need to be able, not just, you know, indigenous people, but other people need to be able to access these areas. And as it's times that we're the boots on the ground that sees what's going on and bring up these concerns. So I am not behind wilderness designation. And there needs to be a better understanding of what's going on. And I applaud you uh, in the science community for acknowledging there's a lot to be learned about the environment that you don't understand. And when you're speaking to tribes, you need to speak to the actual membership of these tribes. We do have great employees, but they're not the actual Seminole, Miccosukee, and people. You need to have these conversations with the actual Seminole and Miccosukee people to get a better understanding of their knowledge of these landscapes. It's not to say that these other non-Indians who work for their tribes aren't doing their job. They are, but they don't have that additional knowledge that we have of this landscape. Thank you. Mike Alfenbein. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a great day. It's been a wonderful meeting. And because I'm limited to three minutes, I'm just going to focus on some of the things that I think are important. 
I mean, I'm still stuck on Pedro's comments. Uh, Pedro's comments were half truths. And I think that the comments you've heard today, the comments I've sent to you in emails and that dozens of others of people have sent to you by email or voice or these meetings um, certainly warranted you guys having a discussion beyond Pedro telling it how it is. And that's how it is because uh, uh, I regret not having been there today, but someone uh, representing the FWC uh, should have taken that opportunity to at least offer a uh, differing position and letting everybody know that the FWC, the state agency responsible for fish and wildlife management, is opposed to wilderness designations. Not Mike Elfenbein, the executive director of Cypress Chapter for Isaac Walton League. No, the state of Florida, who is responsible for the fish and wildlife, opposes wilderness designations. And you guys have talked about things ad nauseum today that we've talked about in countless meetings. And none of you went beyond Pedro's comments to address wilderness designations. So to answer your question, Lawrence, I would suggest for your next scientific coordination group meeting, we pr propose some kind of scientific study that either does or doesn't validate the need for wilderness designations. And if it finds that there's no reason for them, we take them off of Everglades National Park while we're at it. There is no way that the indigenous people, the state of Florida, and the stakeholders who give their blood, sweat, and tears to the big cypress in the Everglades could tell you that wilderness is bad, and you guys believe, Pedro, that it's the greatest thing and we should do it. I implore you guys, you guys are the venue, you're the group, the body, that should be discussing this. It has significant detrimental impacts to the environment that we're purporting to be working to, to, to fix, to be better. And you're going along with the proposal at the behest of a few to the detriment of all simply because the magic wand says so. And um, I hope you guys can find a way to work through that because wilderness designations have proven to be horrible for Everglades National Park and they will be the same catastrophe for Big Cypress National Preserve. And God help us all. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was our last public commenter. Sandy, I'm not seeing any more. Last call for public comment for our online community. We'll give it just a moment. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the public online that's participating and staying in for this meeting. Appreciate the com We all appreciate the comments from the public here. Um, next steps and closing comments for everybody. We're going to go right down the right down with our co-chairs and Adam for any follow-up actions or any next step conversation. We do have a work our next working group and science coordination group meeting is scheduled for March 18th, 19th, or 20th. And you should have some hold or pencil in dates on those on your calendar. Um, Adam, closing remarks. Thank you, James. Uh, good meeting. Um, look forward to seeing what the outcome is for the next meeting agenda items from the science if we can get up to speed that quickly yeah so he mentioned the uh, next meeting of the working group science coordination group we we're going to have that at long key i said to somebody that we were going to have it at long key and they got all excited and i was like no not the one in the keys right the long key nature uh natural um area um in fort lauderdale um, so anyway that's where we're going to be having the next one and i think that we're going to be co-locating with possibly uh for coral reef coordination team um, meeting as well. That's why it's a couple of days in there. We put it together for that. Um, and again, bring any agenda items uh, forward um, for, for that next meeting. We'll get cracking on that right away. Um, there was a correction. The um, advisory group for uh, advisory body for invasive species is not meeting on the 29th. It's actually uh, a couple of days later on the 31st. Um, just a slight correction out there. Um, and also this advisory body may come back to you at some point for uh, workshop support um, and, and so forth uh, to advance that. So um, really that's all I have remember reporting April, uh, March, April, May. Um, and we're gonna get uh, a lot of activity regarding that. Thank you. I'll just put a plug in for Long Key Nature Center, still worth getting excited about. Lawrence? Uh, thank you all for giving us your time uh, 
took a day out of your schedule. I hope it was beneficial. I hope that you brought something you needed to bring to be heard. I hope you felt heard. Um, I think that this forum is just fantastic and, and I appreciate everybody's input today. Thank you. I don't know how to beat what Lawrence just said, so I'll echo and <laughs> say thank you everyone for your participation today. Nick? All right, Adam, thank you. And I'd like to thank all of our members and your team backstage for setting everything up. I'll send a thank you out now to Broward County for supporting our meeting at Long Key Nature Center in Davie. And with that, I think we'll bring the meeting to a close.